36 minutes and all done, so well done. Uh, we now move on to a motion on the supply resolution for the Northern Ireland estimates. Further vote on account. I'll ask the clerk to read the motion. That the motion relating to the supply resolution for the Northern Ireland estimates further vote on account as detailed on the order paper be agreed. I call the Minister for Finance, Mr Conor Murphy, to move the motion. Moved. pre last Gancora. Thank you. The motion has been moved. The Business Committee has allowed up to four hours for this debate. The Minister will have 30 minutes to allocate at his discretion between proposing and winding. The Chair of the Finance Committee will have 10 minutes to speak, and all other speakers will have seven minutes. I call the Minister to open the debate on the motion. Minister. Uh, this debate covers the supply resolution for a further vote on account for the 2020-21 financial year. The associated document was laid in the Assembly on the 20th of May this, this year. I would like to explain to the Assembly why I am taking the unusual step of laying a second vote on account. The Budget Act NI 2020 passed the Assembly in March, included a, a vote on account which allowed departments to continue to spend until main estimates could be considered in June. However, the response to COVID has meant that some departments have had to spend more than anticipated. The Executive has allocated an additional £1.2 billion as part of its response to COVID-19. In addition, many departments have been front-loading payments in an effort to support business and community groups that rely on government spending. Our analysis suggests that at least five departments may run out of cash before 31 July 2020, and this is the date when a budget would, bill would normally be expected to receive royal assent. One department may potentially reach that limit as early as the 19th of June. If we were to follow the usual process, departments would run out of cash before the estimates document is approved. Having examined the options, the only viable solution is the Assembly's approval for a further vote on account. This will provide authority for departments to continue to spend until the detailed main estimates can be debated later in the year. I plan to bring forward those main estimates in the autumn when the financial position is hopefully more stable. Thank you, Minister. I call the Chair of the Finance Committee, Mr Steve Aiken. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, thank you very much indeed, uh, Mr Principal Deputy Speaker. Uh, may I thank the Minister for his opening remarks and his explanation of why it is necessary for the House to consider, in these extraordinary circumstances, a further vote on account. One of the key priorities for the Committee since the resumption of normal business has been to engage regularly with the Department on the financial landscape in Northern Ireland. Firstly, in order to effectively scrutinise the Department's own resource needs, and secondly, to consider the Department's wider strategic role in coordinating financial resources across government. And indeed, we particularly welcome the Minister's approach and that of the Executive, and we are waiting for expectantly to hear of the economic recovery plan coming from the Minister of Economy, which I think is now about two weeks overdue. This engagement, along with the responsiveness of the Department in supporting the Committee's approach, has been useful in helping the Committee to develop an affecting work, effective working relationship. We look forward to nurturing this important and necessary relationship further, so that the Committee can continue to effectively provide advice and assistance to the Department and scrutinise and challenge as required. By developing this approach, the Committee has been kept informed of the necessity for the business we are debating here today. I would like to express my thanks on behalf of the Committee to all the officials who have been in attendance or have made use of teleconferencing facilities over recent weeks in order to facilitate the Committee's business by responding to the many and varied issues that have been raised with them, not just by the Committee for Finance by most of the statutory committees. We are all acutely aware much has changed in a very short time frame. In fact, change seems to be the only constant. But these changes have been necessary to keep us safe, support business and workers, and assist. We still have much to do to respond to these matters within our control by ensuring that departments have the necessary resources available to them at the point of need. As already outlined, the response of the COVID-19 pandemic has resulted in departments incurring significant spending that was unforeseen at the time of the previous vote of account, and indeed some departments are already reaching their limits. 
Therefore, in order to alleviate the real risk of departments running out of money, we in this House must use our judgment for the continued well-being of our society. As I alluded to earlier, officials from the Department were in attendance at our meetings last week to brief the Committee on the resource requirements across all departments. During the evidence session, the Committee examined the reconciliation between the required resource limits against the budget document and associated COVID-19 allocations in order to understand how these sums were calculated and the allocations made. Members sought and received assurance from officials that, as a result of this vote on account, departments will be sufficiently resourced up until the main estimates and the Budget No. 2 Bill are produced. These ministers are currently expected in September. The Committee also heard that many payments to suppliers, the voluntary and community sector and other organisations were being front-loaded to earlier in the financial year in order to provide any necessary support to these sectors, and this we welcome. However, I would also urge a degree of caution and an element of control to safeguard and ensure that there is a balance between the support required and the risk of a supplier being unable to fulfil its contracted services or functions for the remainder of the financial year when no further payments would be due. Members also explored the, with officials the opportunities that may exist for the executive to use reinvestment and reform initiative, RRI borrowing, as a means to provide other means to reignite our economy. In response, officials helpfully provided clarification that such borrowing is drawn from the National Loans Fund, National Loans Fund and may only be used for capital expenditure and allows borrowing of up to $200 million. Until the true effects of this chapter in our history are fully known, we must continue to explore every option and every available resource to help us achieve our goals. We need to be innovative in our approach and maximise every possible avenue to ensure that Northern Ireland is able to survive, revive and ultimately thrive. This is also needs to be include maximising resources such as financial transactions capital, which could be an effective tool to kickstart our recovery particularly in some of our vital infrastructure like the York Street interchange. Mr Principal Deputy Speaker, this further vote on account is, necessary, is a necessary means to enable departments to continue building on their efforts to support our society. While the £1.2 billion uh, we have received from the United Kingdom Exchequer is significant, we should not underestimate that the task at hand is equally significant. Therefore, we must ensure that the finite levels of additional resources that have been made available to us are used efficiently and effectively to ensure that we achieve the best possible outcome and mitigate the longer-term impacts on our economy. Finally, following an evidence session from the Department of the 29th of April, the Committee asked to be informed of any occasions on which a Department intends to make use of sole authority of the Budget Act to carry out a function, the so-called black box provisions. Full details of these provisions were included in the papers provided by the Department in relation to the vote on account last week. I want to thank the Minister and officials for listening to the Committee and for the improved openness and transparency that is now being demonstrated. As I will outline during the second stage debate on the Budget No. 2 Bill, the Committee for Finance has approved accelerated passage for the Budget Bill to be introduced by the Minister later today. On behalf of the Committee for Finance and the Ulster Unionist Party, we support this motion. Thank you, Mr Deputy Principal Speaker. Thank you. I call the Chair of the Communities Committee, Paula Bradley. Thank you, Mr Principal Deputy Speaker. When we were here during the last vote on account, I don't think there were many of us that thought we'd be back again a couple of months later for a further vote on account. Despite the additional expenditure on COVID-19, the allocation of 45% of the 2019 2020 departmental provision would have been expected to have seen us through until consideration of the main estimates in June. However, following a briefing by departmental officials on the budget, I remember referring in the House to the considerable uncertainty regarding the Department's finances that was a consistent theme in relation to that briefing, also all as a result of COVID-19. The fast, evolving nature of the crisis and the consummate response by the Department seemed to overtake proposed expenditure before the ink was dry on any briefing papers. The Department for Communities has been at the forefront of supporting vulnerable people, 
with a range of initiatives implemented, implemented at great pace. This has involved front-loading expenditure, sometimes without knowing how much these will cost. I must say that, while necessary, we have sometimes reflected on what this will mean for subse subsequent financing of departmental programmes whenever we get back to normal, whatever normal may look like. It is extraordinary circumstances when, instead of main estimates in June, we have another vote on account. The idea that technically departments are running out of cash is remarkable. I don't know if the impact of that has quite sunk in. A couple of weeks ago, the committee heard from Solace about councils and how they could be close to collapse in the next few months. Last week, we heard about the dire straits that the voluntary and community sector is in. Tomorrow, it is the turn of the arts sector, and next week, the sports sector. While I applaud the actions of the Minister for Communities, and indeed all Ministers, I can't help but think of the fictional story of the little Dutch boy who put his finger in the leaking dam to prevent people from drowning, in the hope that someone would come and fix the dam properly. This vote on account and the subsequent bill for its approval are clearly necessary to get us through the next few months. But what assurance do we have that our finances will be any more stable position when we come to autumn? The cash requirement in the vote on account for the Department for Communities is 80 per cent of its 2019-20 provision, which is what we are told should ensure it is able to continue to provide services to the end of October. I note and welcome the additional COVID-19 allocation of just over £20.3 million from the Executive and the potential for a further £20 million. No doubt every penny of this will be spent. I also note that £23.5 million will be spent on welfare reform mitigations under the sole authority of the Budget No. 2 Bill. The Committee has asked about the necessary legislation to ensure this expenditure is on a proper footing, but despite briefings from the Minister, there is still no sight of this. We can't go on pushing this down the pipeline. If we are to have a sound hold on our finances, then we need to agree on big ticket items like welfare mitigations. Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker, these are difficult times. As we come through this crisis, we may have to face up to the prospect of a very different society. We may have to accept that at some point that limited financial resources bring with them difficult choices. That time might not be now, and it may not even be in the autumn, but when all is said and done, we have to be prepared for a possible reckoning, and that is going to take considerable will, effort and vision. Thank you. Thank you. I call Mr Sean Lynch. I get the uh, privilege to call you, and I thank the Minister for her statement. As people have outlined, we are faced with a unique situation. Therefore, the normal budgetary process cannot happen at this uh, moment. The accelerated passage outlined is complex in nature. However, to be fair to the officials uh, who came to the uh, committee, they did simplify it for us. This budget bill is basically to avoid the uh, departments run out of cash before the main estimates are set out. It will give approval for cash and use of reserves to use funds during this public health crisis. We did not know the full impact of COVID back in March when the budget bill was passed. Since then, departments have had to spend greater amounts of cash than anticipated. The priority became keeping people afloat, keeping wages paid, protect livelihoods and businesses as best as possible. When we discussed the Minister's request for accelerated passage through the Assembly and certain standing orders had to be suspended, issues of transparency, accountability and main estimates were discussed. However, uh, previous can call you, there were little options as some departments could run out of cash and the Minister has already said there today as early as uh, in June. The COVID-19 crisis has necessitated unprecedented and high public spending. The scale, timing and pace of the crisis means the reality is that this legislation is required to ensure that all public services can continue to be delivered during this COVID-19 uh, period. Uh, to support the health service, as business and vulnerable people, I support the motion. Thank you. I call Mr Matthew O'Toole. 
Thank you, um, Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker. Um, we're back today um, with a further vote on account, one that is necessary, I agree, and I should say up front that we as a party um, will be supporting this further vote on account and the Budget Number 2 Bill, which we'll be technically debating later on today. Um, not only are we giving this bill accelerated passage, as Sean Lynch just mentioned, but we are in fact debating and passing um, it, uh, both the budget number two, the budget number two bill, and this further vote and account a month before we normally would in ordinary budget times. Since we came back in January for the Northern Ireland Assembly, budget debates ha have been a little bit like London buses. We've waited three years for one, and then we've had about half a dozen at once. The truth is, we've had quite a lot of debates, but we haven't had uh, that much scrutiny. Uh, while, as I said, my party will be supporting this further vote and account and this budget number two bill, there are concerns. Uh, um, uh, there are concerns both about the specifics of the provisions, but also about the continued lack of anything approaching a programme for government or a joined-up long-term policy response to COVID-19. And that's critical because we're being asked to make this further vote and account specifically because of the unique and exceptional contingency of the COVID-19 crisis. So, first, the specifics of this further vote and account. We are effectively voting to give the Department of Finance permission to disperse uh, virtually all, and in some cases more than all, i.e. more than 100 per cent of the, 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 normal, uh, the, the full year cash for departments in order to prevent them running out of money in the next couple of months. This is a reflection of the extraordinary pressures being created by COVID-19, including decisions by departments to front-load spending in order to ensure contractors and community groups get the benefit of planned spending now when they need support the most. That is welcome in principle. But there are significant questions about our capacity to scrutinise how that money is spent, uh, and it will put extreme pressure on the uh, main estimates which come later this year and also the in-year monitoring rounds. It will put an extreme onus both on the Finance Committee, of which I am a member, but also this whole Assembly, to give proper and detailed scrutiny to those monitoring rounds. There are also some questions that I have about money which is being centrally held to deal with as yet unspecified priorities. I have a particular bee in my bonnet about centrally held items, given I discovered a couple of weeks ago that we are still centrally holding £2 million a year to subsidise non-existent long-haul flights to North America at a time when we have no short-haul connectivity. But anyway, uh, back to those uh, unspecified uh, centrally held items. In a background paper which the Finance Committee was given, um, the Department specified a particular category of allocation in a summary document to us. Um, so this was a summary document provided as a background paper to the Finance, uh, Finance Committee. The, the Department described some of the allocations that have been made as potential COVID allocations, and this includes the £95 million for the Infrastructure Department. So this was set out in some detail in the background paper, Mr Principal Deputy Speaker, but isn't covered in the summary document that we've been provided here today, the, the further vote on account. Um, but this background paper made clear that some of these, these are potential COVID-19 allocations, but, um, and I quote, this should not be taken as confirmation that this funding will ultimately be provided to this department. Rather, it is simply a working assumption. Now, that £95 million for the Transport Department, and there are other departments, including Health and Communities, who have potential COVID-19 allocations, but it is particularly critical, given what we have just heard from the Infrastructure Minister about pressures facing her department, Northern Ireland Water, and our transport network. Um, if that £95 million is still a potential COVID-19 allocation, it would be helpful to know from the Finance Minister uh, to have it confirmed that it is not going to be taken off the department and reallocated elsewhere. Indeed, the Finance Minister's statement last week said that 59.5 of that 95 million transport allocation remained uh, unallocated, but the background paper that our, department or our committee received indicated that it could be reallocated at a later date. It would be helpful to have clarity to that on that. Um, and moving on to the broader picture, Mr Deputy Speaker, um, uh, you know, it is somewhat discouraging, um, though I welcome uh, the, the fact that his department has moved fast in terms of allocations. It's somewhat depressing that we're having a major budgetary intervention in the absence of not just an agreed programme for government, but even a, a, a date when we will be uh, debating a joined-up economic and fiscal response to the COVID-19 crisis. Um, much of the action by his department and the executive has been welcome, but we now need something that is longer term and less based on pop-up policy. Um, yes, COVID-19 is an extreme, uh, is an extreme, um, has, has placed an extreme exigency on the department, but um, 
but we are getting now to the place where we need much where we where we need longer term policy. And um, when we debated the budget itself a couple of weeks ago, um, it was there was a somewhat confusion, uh, somewhat confused document. Some departments were working to the draft 2016 programme for governments, others didn't mention a programme for government at all. So it would be helpful to know whether a new programme for government is in the offing and to what extent departments are working from a draft programme for government in terms of their budget planning. Um, as the chair of my committee said, it would be helpful to know when we are debating a long-term economic and fiscal response. There are many things uh, that are unknown uh, as we come out of this crisis, but there are things that we do know. People treasure properly funded health care. Uh, it has changed the way we work and the way we relate to places. We've heard from the infrastructure minister about the long-term vision she has for changing our towns and cities and, and active travel. Um, we know that our economy and those around the world will change fundamentally as a result of this crisis. But in the short term, there are also severe damage to sectors which are disproportionately important to our economy, hospitality and tourism, small independent retail and indeed micro business in general. We don't just need an economic recovery plan, though we desperately need that. We need a joined up strategy which looks at our fiscal levers and the kind of society we want in five years time. And just to spell out what I mean, as I've discussed and we've discussed in this assembly many times, the sole fiscal lever that we have used and has been politically acceptable to use in the executive is small business rates. And that small business rates hit the sectors of the economy that are most uniquely damaged by COVID-19. So Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, we'll be going on to debate the budget bill later this afternoon um, and I'll have time to expand further on some of these thoughts and I hope I'll find some agreement with the Finance Minister on them. Um, but I would just leave with the, with the thought that while many of these allocations are welcome, we do now, we are over time for a joined up economic and fiscal strategy. Um, welcome, you know, friendly TV interviews are welcome, and, uh, but they are, um, I'm afraid, not enough when it comes to a long term um, strategy. We need, uh, we need something joined up in both economic policy and fiscal policy terms. Thank you very much, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. Thank you. I call the Chair of the Education Committee, Mr. Chris Little. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. I begin by speaking on behalf of the Committee for Education. This has, of course, been a challenging year in budgetary terms for the Executive and the Department of Education, and the Department of Education is struggling to overcome a backlog of financial pressures of over £400 million and like all executive departments, is faced with the challenge of responding to COVID-19. The Department of Education advised the Committee for Education at the end of April that lockdown has reduced some pressures, but many more have increased and new pressures have arisen. The Education Committee noted the substantial additional budget allocated to provide free school meal payments, increase Sure Start, support childcare provision, increase the Early Years Pathway Fund, provide a substitute teacher hardship fund, and procure a substantial number of devices to aid equal access to distance and blended learning. The Education Committee, of course, welcomes this additional funding and the vital support it provides during this emergency. Many committee members would also wish to see additional funding to support tackling holiday hunger, extending counselling services, and further support for vulnerable children. They also require further rationale for the additional funding which is being sought by the Education Minister for preparatory and boarding schools. <laughs> Notwithstanding these comments, Mr Speaker, the Education Committee supports the supply resolution for the further vote on account as it applies to the Department of Education. Principal Deputy Speaker, I'd now like to make a few comments as an Alliance MLA and party spokesperson for education. We are, of course, in the midst of a global pandemic, and the focus of the Executive and Department of Education must be on the emergency response to COVID-19. The Alliance Party supports this supply resolution to allocate executive funds, but the Executive, and in particular the Minister for Education, cannot forego the action needed to address the financial crisis facing the education system in addition to the challenge of COVID-19. The former Education Authority CEO warned in 2017 that without radical investment and reform, the education system would be unaffordable, socially immobile and unfit for 21st century learning. Principal Deputy Speaker, our education system currently has a crumbling school estate, excessive class sizes, a sane framework that is failing children with special educational needs, 
the separation of children on the basis of community background at age five, and an unfair and unnecessary approach to post-primary transfer. Despite the dedication and professionalism of our teaching and non-teaching staff, this is not the education system we should want for our children and young people. And fundamental root and branch reform remains urgently necessary for education. It is concerning, therefore, that the Education Minister has suspended work towards the drafting of terms of reference for the independent review of education proposed by the Alliance Party and supported by this Assembly. That existing reports, such as Burns, Costello, Bain, Iliad, Heenan and Solberg, have not been implemented and that area-based planning has been so ineffective and sectoral-based. The focus on COVID-19 is, of course, understandable, and indeed schools need urgent guidance on social distancing, curriculum content and blended learning now, and to prepare for the proposed phase return to school in August. This focus, however, must not be used as cover to unduly delay the urgent action and reform needed to arrest the financial crisis in education. Nor can investment and progress towards the childcare strategy, school budgets, the emotional health and wellbeing framework, and the new special educational needs framework, including the SEN regulations and code of practice, be shelved. The people of Northern Ireland demand better, and we must work together to deliver it. A well-resourced, innovative and integrated education system to deliver high-quality educational opportunity for all is needed now more than ever. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. Thank you. I call the Chair of the Infrastructure Committee, Ms Michelle McElveen. Thank you, Mr Principal Deputy Speaker, and I welcome this opportunity again to outline the Committee for Infrastructure's consideration and views in respect of today's debate. Firstly, I'd like to reiterate the size of the deficit facing the Department going into the current pandemic and then move on to speak about the impact of COVID-19. The Committee's scrutiny of the Department's finances has highlighted again and again the stark situation it faces. The Department for Infrastructure told the Committee in January that its budget had a recurring structural deficit of £61 million going into 2021, set to rise to £80 million in 2021-22 and £90 million in 2022-23. This was before the COVID pressures um, that have since arisen. The Department's budget for 2021 has increased by 8.6%, which amounts to an additional £33 million on last year. But despite that, it does remain inadequate. And the Department has warned again and again of the severe implications this, this will have on critical infrastructure services. The Minister has told the Committee that she has yet to decide on the final distribution of allocations at this point. However, given the issues already highlighted and the significant shortfall between available and required funds, we know that there will be a number of pressures that the final allocations will struggle to address. The first is water and sewage. The utility regulator's determination on Northern Ireland water funding is inescapable. It has not been funded to the recommended levels, meaning that it's unable to connect new housing developments and businesses to sewage networks at over 100 locations in Northern Ireland. The potential impact on the economy will only increase in the COVID recovery period and does not consider funding requirements of the Living with Water programme over the next decade. Water and wastewater is, of course, just the first area of concern. Officials also told the committee that prior to the 2014-15 budget reductions, some £35 million would have been allocated to cover routine road maintenances and water and winter requirements. In recent years, this budget has been cut to less than half. The implications of this are stark, but no less stark than the recent Barton and NIAO reports on structural maintenance of the roads network, which recommend the departments for finance and infrastructure work towards ensuring funding of some £143 million per annum on a recurring basis to prevent further deterioration. Turning then to community transport, we are all aware of the important role this plays in connecting our rural communities, so the committee noted with concern a reduction in the department's provision to a number of these organisations in 2019-20, which amounts to some at 35% in the overall baseline since 2013-14. The committee noted that community transport initiatives across Northern Ireland assist in access to and facilitation of services that are the remit of other departments. And we have raised the question as to whether other departments should not be assisting with its funding. It welcomed the announcement by DFI and DERA that joined up measures have been put in place um, to support people in rural areas isolated through COVID-19, but more of this could be done. And the list of pressure goes on. 
uh, contract to buy new carriages for the rail network, procurement of new buses, funding for Waterways Ireland, and the design phase of York Street, to name but a few. And I've left the most notable shortfall, of course, to last. And Translink has been forced to run its service at a deficit over a number of years and to use its reserves to supplement this. As the £19 million requested for Translink in the monitoring round was unsuccessful, their reserves next year will be below the level of working capital that it needs. And we face the very real possibility that it may cease to be deemed a going concern. The COVID crisis has seen Translink's revenue streams dry up. As we gradually move out of lockdown and into our new normal, which will require social distancing, there will inevitably be an impact on our public transport service. Additional vehicles will be required to accommodate in order to travel, transport children to and from school and employees to and from their places of work safely. So the question arises, how will this be funded? The money has to be found from somewhere and the recent statement by the Minister of Finance is not encouraging. So what impact will this extra requirement have on the budget in particular, green um, recovery schemes and capital infrastructure projects? The committee is aware that there is a COVID uh, fund designed to mitigate the challenges arising out of the COVID crisis. And in a briefing of the COVID response and on, on the budget, the minister set out a departmental estimate of up to £181 million in COVID-related pressures, 90 to £114 million from the loss of revenue to Translink, between 17.5 and 32 million for Northern Ireland Water, and 8.6 million for three months, increasing to 19.4 million for six months and 30.7 million for nine months for the DVA. And yet, despite this and the pre-existing shortfalls, the committee found itself in the position of writing to the Finance Minister to seek clarification on why the Department for Infrastructure was the only one not to have received an allocation from the COVID fund at that stage. Some additional funding allocations were announced in the Finance Minister's statement last week, namely the £30 million set aside to mitigate loss of income in Translink, but it is clear this is still just a drop in the ocean. The Committee looks forward to hearing that additional funding from the remaining £59 million of the Transport Budget, which is still to be allocated, will be earmarked for the Department of Infrastructure. However, even with this, it is clear that hard decisions about key priorities will still need to be made going forward, even without the Department's obligations under the New, deal, new Decade, New Approach deal. There is a strong argument that not only will significant investment in infrastructure mitigate existing risks, but it will be vital in kick-starting our recovery as we move out of lockdown. The Committee for Infrastructure will, of course, continue its scrutiny of the Department for Infrastructure budget going forward. In addition, I'd like to make some um, personal remarks in relation to community transport. And as a representative of a rural constituency, I am genuinely, uh, genuinely concerned that, um, as we should be, about the impact of COVID-19 on the budgets of our local providers. Approximately 35% of their budgets come from self-generated income. And as a result of the lockdown, social distancing, achieving opportunities to fill that gap have ceased. And if we're to believe the Deputy First Minister that social distancing is to remain in place for the next two years, many of these organisations will not be in existence. And while I welcome that DFI is now assisting those organisations with furloughing staff, this will only go part of the way of easing their burden. And if the Department of Infrastructure, alongside the Department of Finance, do not work together to uplift the grant available by some 20 to 30 per cent for those organisations who need it, this service will be lost and very soon. Thank you, Mr. Deputy, Principal Deputy Speaker. Thank you. I call the Chair of the Economy Committee, Dr. Kiva Archibald. Um, and I rise to speak firstly as Chair of the Economy Committee. The Committee is acutely aware that, um, that the Department for the Economy has been in the eye of the storm, storm, so to speak, in responding to this devastating crisis. That, amongst other reasons, is why the Department for the Economy is one of the five departments that are likely to run out of funding by the end of June, hence the need for today's vote on account. As I have highlighted on a number of occasions, the Committee is extremely supportive of the Department and indeed the Executive's COVID-19 response so far, and is advising both on gaps and issues in that response, as well as strategies and solutions going forward to recover and rebuild through our extensive stakeholder network. Members will acknowledge that as a key driver of the COVID-19 response, the Department for the Economy must have its budgetary needs prioritised as much as possible. 
The committee is aware that the department is seeking to repurpose and reprioritise its budget and that of its arm's length bodies as part of the June monitoring process to allow it to allocate further funding to its COVID-19 response. The committee is very supportive of that proactivity on the part of the department. Members would also urge the executive to consider any further funding that the department may need to widen out its COVID-19 response so that more businesses and sectors can be included and to fund the recovery being made available through the upcoming June monitoring round. The committee appreciates that this crisis and the job of keeping this place running requires considerable funding. However, the Department for the Economy has a unique role in not only responding to the current crisis, but in leading our recovery and rebuilding forward following it. The Department for the Economy continues to lead the response to Brexit and the impact of the protocol. It is dealing with the RHI inquiry response and it is driving forward strategies across a range of policy areas, including energy, tourism, further and higher education, skills and others, that will be key to our recovery when the terrible human tragedy of the COVID-19 um, crisis abates. The Department also leads in a number of key actions coming from New Decade New Approach, which will assist our recovery. The committee will continue in its work of scrutinising the Department for the Economy's use of its budget and supports today's vote and account, but members are also being very proactive in collating the solutions to this crisis that our stakeholders are bringing to us, allowing us to provide the Economy Minister and the Executive with significant information to inform our recovery and the rebuilding of not only our economy but our society too. I would remind members that statutory committees have a key role in advising and supporting ministers in the development of policy. That is a role that the Economy Committee is fulfilling and will continue to fulfil regardless of any obstacles. I will now make some brief remarks as Sinn Féin Economy spokesperson. Obviously, COVID-19 has had a huge budgetary impact and there are very real challenges facing the economy and wider society as we respond. The necessary measures put in place to protect public health have forced many businesses to close and workers to stay at home. The funding that has been made available to support businesses, 410 million in grant support and over 300 million in rates relief, has been most welcome. But the Minister will likely agree that further support will be required to help businesses recover and to protect jobs and livelihoods in the time ahead. Some sectors have missed out on, in terms of the business support grants, including sole traders, small manufacturing with NAV over 15,000. Some businesses in the um, sectors most impacted with NAV over 51,000, and they will need specific support to recover in the longer term. Social enterprises with charitable status and the newly self-employed. These are all entrepreneurs or SMEs who have invested their time, energy and money into their businesses, which are vital to our local economy and do need support also. The race holiday has, of course, provided much needed relief, but many of these businesses are suffering from lack of cash and are understandably reluctant to take out loans when they are unsure if they will recover to repay these. I know the Finance Minister has asked departments to look closely at their budget and the Economy Minister must explore what further support is required and what funding within the department can be redirected towards supporting businesses to survive and to stimulate economic recovery alongside what the executive is doing and allocating funds to the COVID-19 response. The British Government will also need to step up with additional support in terms of financial and fiscal stimulus. The coronavirus job retention scheme has been vital, but its continuation and flexibility um, on the scheme will also be necessary in the time ahead. It is becoming increasingly apparent that some businesses may only slowly come out of lockdown and some sectors will take much longer to reopen and longer still to become profitable again. It will be important that the Executive has a comprehensive plan for economic and societal recovery, guided of course by the medical and scientific advice. I have been contacted both individually and via the Economy Committee by businesses, representative organisations and others with innovative proposals around how they can reopen safely and possible support measures that will be required, not just financial but also practical. It is vital that there is a collaborative approach to the recovery plan and I welcome the continued work of the Engagement Forum which has brought together businesses, trade unions and others and I believe it must have a role in the longer term also. We must all, government, business, academia, community and voluntary, work together in the days, weeks and months ahead to come out of this. I support the supply resolution. Thank you. I call Mrs Pam Cameron. Mr Deputy Principal Speaker. Um, Mr Speaker, or Mr. Deputy Speaker, when I consider um, in respect of our budgetary process, I always revert back to the fact that we all stand on a platform of delivering 
the best possible public services, uh, the best value to the taxpayer, and that is certainly what uh, my party stands for. Regardless of the department, um, that should be at the very heart of the budgetary process. As Deputy Chair of the Health Committee, we have sat through much evidence around the department's budgeting, its drive for savings and so on. But, Mr Deputy Speaker, surely the consequence of COVID-19 will be able to simply obliterate all financial planning within our health service to date. Already in year we see pressures, the costs of COVID. This will be no different next year and for who knows how long. This is a budget that will continue to face unprecedented challenges. Who on these benches does not want to see a more interventionist approach by our health department when it comes to the welfare of our older people, particularly in care homes? How much will PPE cost the health service moving forward? In the context of social distancing, how will we invest in our health service to ensure patients receive the best care with the smallest risk? How do we address the huge mental health problems within our society? All this is going to cost huge sums of money. Add to that the obesity crisis amongst our population and the pressures that brings, that brings to our health service and the fact that we live in an increasingly um, older population. Indeed, we're living more medically complicated lives thanks to our incredible NHS and those involved in research and development. Mr Deputy, Principal Deputy Speaker, there will be more pressures to come on the budget. The urgent need to step up our care and support for those with autism is clear. It is something our health department ha has as yet not taken seriously enough. Yet diagnosis is now just over one in every 20 school children. We can no longer look the other way to see all these people in need of help. These are immediate issues that need addressed as the urgent need to reboot our health service in terms of routine surgery, diagnostics and cancer care are to name a few areas. Surely with these pressures, we cannot allow the bin go up a report to gather dust. The longer it does, the longer our health service will fail to deliver that fundamental principle, that being the best value to the taxpayer and the best possible service. I once again urge the Minister to set out his roadmap for reform, to be bold, let it be an ambitious timeline that equips our health service to meet each and every possible challenge that comes our way. We have the best possible asset in this our world-class staff, but we must support them, not just in the right pay and recognition, but also with the right tools to do the job as best they can. Mr Principal Deputy Speaker, COVID-19 ought to have given each and every one of us food for thought as to what really matters in life. Our time on this place is short, and what really matters, which should shape how we prioritise the spending of the public's money. It is a test for this place to be mature and grown up in those spending decisions, to prioritise spending on areas that ultimately matter less and to much less people than, say, tackling suicide or helping children with speech and language therapy. I certainly know where my priority lies, Mr Deputy Speaker. Thank you. Thank you. I call the Chair of the Health Committee, Mr Colin Gildernew. Eriam Laholis <laughs> Arinch live or Waknu and Kwesta Shlansha, Freena Brew, Argus Reha. I rise today to uh, provide some information on the Health Committee's consideration of current financial pressures. No discrete briefing has taken place in terms of the Department's assessment of when its resources would be exhausted without today's initiative, but the budget briefing last month provided some broad brush strokes in terms of additional costs associated with COVID-19. Officials were keen to underline how uncertain the picture was at that point. Marisol doing to plan Isle Mwinu Agus Gur e Wayam Servishi in a Kier Tuhal de Yashka, Nagirhem Shlancha, Agus Kincha, Gomeshe, Amach and Shaw. As we know, the ongoing health crisis has caused massive upheaval in planning, funding and delivering services and is likely to continue to do so. With strong warnings as to the fluidity of the situation, the Department advised the Committee last month on its assessment that costs of COVID-19 could run to upwards of $500 million in resource expenditure, significantly more than it had received at that point, but officials also expressed a degree of hope that pandemic costs would be met. Kuru and Korlia Fui Namwestechen Tosi Shaw Alianus Erin The Committee was advised of the following estimates. 
104 million required for workforce pressures, including deployment of retirees and students to provide additional frontline support, as well as overtime, accommodation for staff and recruitment costs. 232 million required for equipment and supply, including PPE, the increased cost of drugs, and emergency supply of medicines to vulnerable patients, and around 200 million for additional service delivery costs, such as increased hospital admissions, including ICU, COVID-19 testing, emergency dental facilities, and supporting key delivery partners in the pharmacy and dental sectors. The Department was also estimating a further $1 million to support digital health and communications as part of the COVID-19 response. Finally, a further $16.5 million capital expenditure was projected in relation to oxygen generators, IT requirements and COVID assessment centre facilities. Officials advised us that it was not possible at the time to quantify a range of additional costs, such as additional ventilators being purchased, reconfiguration of hospitals, contracts with the independent hospitals for additional capacity, and ongoing requirements for PPE and testing as the pandemic progresses. More recently, costs have been incurred in relation to scaling up the contact tracing operation. At that point, the Department had been allocated $205 million, with a further $150 million held in central reserves for PPE. The Department did acknowledge a number of financial knock-on effects of the pandemic. It forecast that due to redeployments to deal with the crisis, there would be less capacity to, to conduct other routine services. The Committee has been advised of lower than usual attendance at GPs and emergency departments, leading to concerns that patients could begin to present with cancers or heart conditions at a more advanced stage. Clearly, this is primarily a health concern, and people should be encouraged to come forward for their own well-being, but it will also create greater pressure on the system as more advanced treatments or preventable surgeries are needed. We have been advised that in deferring elective procedures, the already serious waiting list backlog is now worse, and again, some people's conditions may have deteriorated to the point that they now need more serious interventions. The Committee was advised in April that financial planning in the HSC was likely to remain uncertain for the next three months, at least, though additional costs, as I have outlined, are demonstrable. For all these reasons, though the Health Committee has not had a chance to come to a formal view on the vote on account, I am sure members will welcome extra resource going into the HSC at this time. I would like to make a few additional remarks now as Sinn Féin Spokesperson for Health. The unprecedented nature of the COVID-19 crisis has put us in a political space where we must take prompt, effective and necessary action to reduce the impact of the virus across our communities. Prior to the onset of the COVID-19 crisis, we were already faced with significant budgetary pressures brought on by 10 years of Tory austerity that has starved our public services right across the board. Our block grant of £360 million, which in real terms below pre-austerity levels, has left us with health, education, infrastructure and other sectors starved of the resources they so badly need. The health service is a case in point. Staff shortages, record levels of waiting lists and unaddressed and significant and growing health inequalities across our communities are just some of the challenges we already faced when this Assembly resumed in 2020. As the COVID-19 crisis took hold in our society, it is clear that our health service was ill-equipped to deal with the pandemic. Shortages of the most basic equipment highlighted in no uncertain terms that austerity had left us exposed and vulnerable in any emergency. The New Decade New Approach document raised hopes that we, as a decision-making body, could begin to address the impact of Tory austerity. Sadly, the British Government reneged on many of the promises contained within that agreement, and we are left with public services and a health service that, quite frankly, operate on life support. The impact of COVID-19 cannot be overstated. Sadly, we have lost loved ones, friends and neighbours. The economic crisis we face will be significant and perhaps unlike anything we have ever seen before. We know this crisis will be exacerbated by the economic and political upheaval of Brexit, a reality brought to us by the worst instincts of British exceptionalism and one that we as a society did not vote for. Hug COVID-19 douche line Rowan agus satohi ak lirian she doing gargya doing ruddy ayanu ervalak defrul. 
COVID-19 has presented us with many challenges for the time ahead, but it has also shown us that we must do things differently going forward. We must choose a path of economic and social justice. We must build a health service that protects all our citizens from ill health and disease. We must build homes to address the housing crisis. We must address the inequalities that exist all across our society, in health, in education, and in terms of opportunity. We must invest in our communities, in our people, and in our public services. Thank you. I call Mrs. Sinead McLaughlin. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. Minister, I accept the urgency with which this bill needs to proceed through the Assembly. This is driven by the critical need to secure access to cash for departments to continue to deliver the services in the face of the evolving COVID-19 situation. However, I believe the challenge we collectively face is the need to be strategic and coherent as we deal with the worst health and economic crisis we have ever known. Sadly, I don't believe the executive has sufficiently shown the way out of this economic crisis. Yes, it is good that many businesses are being rescued, but we need a plan, and I don't see one. The executive has gone back to the good old days of ministerial compromises without the executive having a joint approach. The old ways of divvying up the money between the two largest parties have returned. But to what end? We are likely to be out of money quickly, very quickly, perhaps with limited lasting impact. What exactly are our priorities? Are we clear that there is no going back to normal? I suggest some priorities. Our young people. We have a generation of young people leaving school, college and university with no jobs to go to. We need a blended skills training and work-based programme that would enhance their skills instead of giving them, them their first taste of the labour market by actually being unemployed. Next is the sustainable infrastructure adapted to the needs of our changed economy, our changed society. We need broadband rolled out across all of Northern Ireland. The Department for the Economy tells me 89% of Northern Ireland has serviceable broadband. That leaves 11% of our proper properties without good enough broadband. For that 11%, this means the impossibility of working from home. For many, the impossibility of keeping their jobs. It means the impossibility of studying from home. It means social isolation. It means vulnerable people being unable to do home shopping. It impacts especially on women isolated at home who continue to take the majority of caring and parenting roles. We need to ensure that the North has broadband fit for the 21st century. We need the fastest possible broadband delivered in the fastest possible rate to the greatest number of properties within a reasonable budget. We also need to accelerate our investment in our water infrastructure. Reflecting on the city deals of Belfast and Derry, we will help to drive our economy out of a deep recession that we're heading into. But without adequate water infrastructure, those developments too may be slow to provide the growth that we need. But we also need to reflect on how our economy and society will be reshaped by the coronavirus. The nine to five, the Monday to Friday office routine has had its time, at least for the moment. This will change how we use our urban centres. This will change our investment strategy. We need to focus our support on the type of economy we want to build for the future, and that is a green economy. We need the Green New Deal. That is the focus on the Europe, of the European Union as they seek to build their way out of this crisis. It is the focus of many in the Democratic Party in the United States. And it is a program here that has won its support right across trade unions, our youth movements, our employers, and across many political parties. We need to get on with it, creating jobs, improving our quality of life, reducing uh, heating costs, improving air quality, cutting carbon emissions. That is our vision for the future. Mr Speaker, whilst we support the vote on account today, there needs to be a greater focus on developing a plan for Northern Ireland. 
It is a shame that we haven't seen a coherent vision from this executive. That is now their challenge. That is now our challenge. That is a collective challenge. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. I call Mr. Alan Chambers. Uh, thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. Uh, whilst recognising uh, that we are not in normal budgetary circumstances, it must be remembered that under the 2020-21 budget that was previously announced by the Finance Minister, our health service was left facing a shortfall of £71.6 million against forecast inescapable pressures. The Finance Minister will have been well aware that his budget allocation only a number of weeks ago would not have enabled the health service to maintain even uh, existing services. Similarly, his budget allocation had not granted the health department a single additional penny to deliver on the further priorities set out in the new decade, new approach document, for which an additional £169 million pounds was estimated. And whilst uh, delivering everything contained in the new decade, new approach was always going to be a long shot, we need to remember that some of, uh, what some of the more important pledges were. For instance, this requirement included much needed investment in enhancing and developing services and covered, for example, vital funding for enhancing and reforming social care, growing social care workforce and improving pay levels. This is something that I presume the Finance Minister still agrees with. In addition, there was a further £50 million sought to fund an elective care action plan in order to allow us as a society to get to grips with what were already truly abhorrent delays in our waiting times. I dread to think what the length of our waiting lists will be uh, or will have grown to post-COVID. I am aware that the Department of Health has, has already listed £30 million as an inescapable cost pressure to maintaining existing services, specifically to control waiting times for red flag, urgent outpatient assessments and elective treatments, which have a direct impact on patient safety and clinical outcomes when diagnosing and treating cancer and other time critical conditions. So to be clear, the Finance Minister's previous health allocation would not have allowed the Health Minister to make any progress on tackling waiting lists. Given the hugely destructive impact COVID-19 has had on elective care services, can the Minister give a commitment that neither he nor his department will now be found wanting whenever the Department of Health inevitably seek the necessary resources to try and repair some of the frightening damage that COVID-19 has inflicted to our already appalling waiting times. And I want to return now to the recently announced Mental Health Action Plan, which recognised that there will be a surge in mental health issues post-COVID-19 and indeed as we continue to return to normality. I would ask the Minister, will it be resourced and what will be the level of that financial support. And also, there's been numerous mentions uh, in this debate so far to Tory austerity. I think that we need to place on record the fact that we are grateful to the British government for the financial help that they have given us as we fight this virus and try to mitigate uh, the impact on our economy. I think we really need to take our blinkers off and recognise that support. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Principal Deputy Speaker. Thank you. Uh, the next speaker is Mr. Paul Frew. Okay, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, I, I thought you maybe would let me. I um, uh, wasn't expecting to be just called so soon, but uh, we'll, we'll carry on. Uh, well, I have to wing it, of course. I, I always wing it, uh, Principal Deputy Speaker. Uh, I suppose the first thing we should say is this is a completely, completely unique situation we find ourselves in here. Uh, I think that when we look at this, one of the biggest worries I have is, is the fact that the officials within the department 
will be out of sync with the normal practices that they have always having to go through. Now, we, should, we shouldn't forget the fact that for a long period of time there was no assembly, no executive, so they weren't in normal circumstances to start with. So that would have put them at a disadvantage straight away. Then, then we have this crisis, this emergency in which we have to deal with. And as we try, as we have tried since we've cranked up the assembly and the executive, we now get into a normal situation where we have a budget and we have a, a, a further, uh, sorry, a vote and account, and things are cranking up to normal, and then we're blasted with this emergency. And we're left in a position whereby departments are going to run out of money. Now, this is not normal circumstance. This is a very surreal problem that we have to deal with as an executive and as an assembly. My worry in all of this, and, and I will give credit to the officials who have had to work and firefight through this emergency with all these figures, all these facts and all these pressures. And I will give credit to the executive with regards to the decision made and, and the minister himself and the decision made last week on the rates. That is a game changer. The, the rates decision will mean that businesses who were contemplating going out of existence now can survive. And that is a very massive pressure and weight off their shoulders. And it's, it's something that has to be welcomed. And I welcome it here. I take the opportunity to welcome it here in this debate because that is a massive thing for businesses. Uh, but here we have a situation where departments, a number of our critical departments are going to run out of money. And we've been left in a position where the department has had to bring a further vote on account. A surreal s situation that we're in. Now, we understand the mechanics of that, and we understand why that is the case. And so we support it. We, we have to. We have no other choice but to support this further vote and account. But what really worries me in this house of scrutiny is how the money is going out and how we can, whilst it's flooding out the doors in a necessity in order to get money down on the ground to finance this emergency, it's the scrutiny around that money, the value for money of that money, where that money is going to. Is it going to service providers and contractors that may not exist to fulfill a contract in the coming months? Is that something that we need to be careful of? Uh, and what about value for money in actually purchasing some of the stuff that we've had to acquire? You know, is it the case that we've been, had to purchase above inflationary prices because the demand is there? And how will that be? How will that information get through to the committees, the scrutiny committees, so that informed decisions can be made as to how we move forward and how we can learn lessons? I'm not for one moment suggesting that after this is all over, we look back with rose tinted glasses or blinkers on and be critical of ministers who have had to make fast decisions. I'm not saying that at all, but I worry about the value for money and the public pound and how it is spent. And it is, it's bound to be the case that when we're having excess flows of money in quick time, that there will be mistakes made. So it's making sure that those mistakes are kept to a minimum, and then making sure at the end of it that they don't happen again if we go to current or another situation like this. Uh, but we should be thankful that we're in a United Kingdom where we have the capacity to draw down Barnet formula money of 1.2 billion, which has helped and saved our people through this crisis that we wouldn't have had the ability to do if we were in any other jurisdiction or if we were in our own. The value of being in the union is invaluable. You can't measure it. It's much more than 1.2 billion. In fact, of course, every year it's much more than that. But it's not just about financial and monetary terms. It's, a, it's about being in the place it's but being in the nation that the United Kingdom gives. This is just one illustration of the capacity and the strength of being in the Union. But many members have said here today that we need to get to a point where not only are we fighting the crisis, 
but we're actually having a strategy and a plan to move forward and recover. And yet, I'm yet to see that plan. I'm yet to see that recovery plan. I'm yet to see a budget being aligned with a programme for government, a programme for government that will help most of this, these issues, uh, just because of the way it's written up at the present time. I know we're talking about another uh, programme for government, but the, the, the previous draft budget wasn't far off the mark. Uh, and it's all about making people's lives better. That's all the sorts of things that we need to recover from. One of the things I will say about the detail about the voting account, and something that has worried me since I, it first appeared, it seems to be the case that everyone, every department, and every arms and body, and everything in between is getting finance, even when they're not running out of money. And it, it worries me that the only body that doesn't get money uh, is the Northern Ireland Authority for the Utility Regulation. Now, again, I know how that's funded, and I know it's not the same as the department, and I know it's not the same as the Food Standard Agency, or the Northern Ireland Assembly Commission, or the Northern Ireland Audit Office. But the principle still remains because Food Standard Agency, the Assembly Commission, and the Audit Office all got higher vote on account for those three bodies is not related to COVID-19 response, but rather it recognises that the 2020-21 budget outcome is higher than their 19-20 position. Could so the member he, bring his so remarks here's, to close? Here's, people, here's bodies that have received money, funding, not related to the COVID-19. Why is it the case that the utility regulator is working on 25% of their budget from the previous year? And have, and have received no money from this vote on account. It seems bizarre to me, and I worry about that going forward. Thank you. For someone that was winging it, you used plenty of time. Um, the business committee is arranged to meet at 1 p.m. today. I therefore propose, by leave of the Assembly, to suspend this sitting until 2 p.m. When we return, we will continue with this item of business, and the next speaker will be Mrs Karen Mullen. Thank you. Resolution for the Northern Ireland Estimates. Further vote on account 2020 2021. And I now call Card. Good morning, As has been pointed out already, this is an unusual measure that we are being asked to support today, but without doubt we must do so. The unusual nature of this measure is reflective of the uncertainty that the COVID crisis has brought with it. I want to take this opportunity to commend the Finance Minister and my party colleague, Conor Murphy. From the outset of this crisis, the Minister has fought to not only save lives but to protect livelihoods. He has also ensured resources may be made available to assist those most in need. From my own role as my party's education spokesperson, this has been entirely evident by his announcements since the return of this Assembly. The Minister increased the level of funding available to the Department of Education by 11 per cent compared to last year. This increase has made it possible to resolve the long-standing industrial action by teachers Significant sums of money have been allocated to the area of special education needs, an area which has been underfunded in recent years and which has impacted on some of the most vulnerable in our society. Last week's announcement of an additional £4 million by the Finance Minister made it possible to provide financial support to our sub-teachers who have been left without an income since schools closed. All of this has been done in the context of a global health pandemic, a pandemic which brings with it not only consequences for, for the health and well-being of our loved ones, but also a very difficult economic, very difficult economic consequences. I have said this before, but I will say it again. The difficulties we, we will face will require new and dynamic thinking. We must see some of the cross-departmental cooperation which has been so successful throughout this crisis to continue. Where opportunities arise, where common outcomes can be achieved, we must look at departments 
We look at how departments can share costs and achieve in them. I urge all our members to support today's vote on account to ensure our public services continue to deliver and operate unhindered in what are truly difficult, difficult and unprecedented circumstances. Thank you. I now call William Irwin. Speaker, I welcome the opportunity to contribute on this matter before the House today. And again, as before, I thank everyone involved within the Assembly Administration for continuing throughout the crisis and providing the structures to allow Assembly business to continue at this time. I speak as a farmer for many years and refer my remarks today to the matters around the business of the Department of Agriculture, Environment and Rural Affairs. Indeed, I must pay tribute to my colleague and Minister for Agriculture, Environment and Rural Affairs, Edwin Pooch MLA, for his efforts to date on behalf not only of the many departmental staff who work behind the scenes within the department, but also for everyone outside the, these walls who work within the agri-food industry and relies on the various services offered by the department. The Minister has shown a knowledge and willingness to push forward and has been proactive in addressing the concerns of the farmer and farming public from a general agricultural perspective and has also been a leading voice in setting out measures and responses due to the current virus crisis in Northern Ireland. The business before the House today is a necessity in terms of ensuring that all the various departmental services across Northern Ireland, whilst in the same cases reduced, in other cases increased, have the necessary budget and authority to continue to operate in these current conditions. I support that determination. Indeed, given the new circumstances that we find ourselves in, our finance department must maintain a very close watch on the financial requirements across the structures and respond as funds allow to the very changeable environment that we now operate due to COVID-19. From a dairy perspective and from a farming perspective, it is clear that our agri-food industry is very much pushing on through this crisis and continues to meet the increasing needs of consumers both here in Northern Ireland and further afield. This attitude, as I have said previously, is commendable and shows the depth of commitment purpose and resolve that exists within our agri-food industry. With everyone involved in our agri-food industry putting their shoulder to the wheel and ensuring the security of our food supplies in this crisis, it is also important that our departments do likewise and continue to provide the necessary services to enable industry to function. And I am pleased to see uh, th this has been happening and must continue. While some services within departments may be on a reduced footing, it is important that structure is maintained and that resources are redirected and best utilised. Where reduced requirements are evident in one element, service delivery it is vital that resources are directed where other requirements have increased due to COVID-19 response. The issue I see with the DEER Department is the, fact, is the fact that despite the pressure of coronavirus, the agricultural sector has had to maintain a high output status. I speak as someone who lives on a farm. Uh, the farm operations have had to continue. The cows need milk, land tended to, crops harvested, uh, and so on. This is repeated on every acre of land farm right across Northern Ireland. Therefore, the department backup has had to be in place in these difficult circumstances. Agri food production is a very heavily monitored industry with many checks and balances in place to maintain our very high food production standards and traceability. Despite the pandemic, this same level of monitoring must continue. That will, of course, in these difficult days, put a strain on the Department. I know the Minister is aware of this reality and will respond to pressure proactively, as he has been doing today. In terms of that Department backup, I have been speaking of. It has been good to see that online facilities made available to farmers by the Department have continued to be taken up and, by and large, successfully. This is an important factor, on which it, when, one which has enabled payments to be checked and com, compiled in a swifter manner. Staff must be credited for the behind the scenes efforts in administering payments with such efficiency. Taking, for instance, single application forms, it is notable that applications of the deadline this year exceeded those received last year proving that despite the current crisis, farmers were able to navigate the system and complete on time. 
In a time of crisis, that is an example of farmers taking all reasonable steps to comply and assist the Department. And whilst there was some discussion around the potential need for deadline extension, this was proven not to have been required, as the application numbers have clearly shown. I commend both farmers and those in the Northern Ireland who assist with farm pulling for their efforts in this regard. Whilst our committee business has been somewhat interrupted and made more difficult due to the pandemic and the response to it, I welcome the further opportunity within the committee to debate and discuss the issues of department resources. As the demand on departments are changing so dramatically and the situation remains so fluid, this will be a very challenging time for all departments within our administration. As the figures across all departments show, the costs associated with government are not small. The assistance that has been offered on both business and families to support people's income at this time has been welcome. However, there, has been, there will be, as has been suggested by the Chancellor himself, a significant downside. And I know the pressures in this administration will undoubtedly greatly increase in the years ahead. We must prepare for this reality, and in closing, I wish everyone involved in the fight against the, this virus my best wishes at this time. I now call Declan McAleer, uh, who is the Chair of the Committee for Agriculture, Environment and Rural Affairs. Um, thank you, Josh uh, Cancoyla. Um, today, today I am speaking as the Chairperson of the Committee for Agriculture, Environment and Rural Affairs. Um, the supply resolution documentation shows that for DERA there is an additional 1.5 million, million available for fishery support. However, it does not mention that the addi additional funding that was allocated uh, from the Finance Minister's statement to the Assembly on the 19th of May, and the statement referenced a further £25 million for agri-food sector market intervention and £3.8 million for waste. And this was a very welcome allocation by the Minister in response to the challenges faced by our agri-food and horticulture sector as a result of the COVID pandemic. The committee was aware that DERA had made a bid for a much larger sum of money. That bid included £105 million for farming and animal welfare, £1 million for rural affairs, £16.7 million for waste and £1.3 million for AFPI. At the stage the bid, the, that bid was made, the £1.5 million for fisheries had already been agreed. The committee had previously considered the planning assumptions behind this initial bid. We were in broad agreement with these uh, planning assumptions and had indicated our support to the Minister's position. We are aware that the request for agri food was so big that it would probably need to come from London and or uh, Brussels. In fact, we wrote to the executive, uh, the MPs and the EU Commission indicating our support for the £105 million uh, uh, for agri food. The committee met with Minister Putz on the Friday 22 May to discuss his plans for this funding. We heard that while the Minister welcomed the £25 million, he indicated that there was no magic uh, bullet and, wouldn't, uh, and won't, this won't go far, given that there were, there were over, um, almost 25,000 farms here in the north. And just following on from uh, Mr Irwin's comments there in relation to the single farm payments, I want to add my commendation to the, the DERA frontline workers and to the, uh, the farm agents across here in the north. There was 24,484 single farm payment applications were processed by the deadline of 15th of May, and that's a, a mighty achievement at any time, never mind in the, in the middle of a COVID pandemic when farmers and others are um, isolating due to the, the crisis. So I want to just place on record that our thanks and commendation for that. Mr Putz indicated that he was mindful at this point to allocate roughly £2.5 million to ornamental plant growers and that the remainder would target sectors such as the dairy and beef sector. But it is clear that this was indicative and that no uh, firm position has yet been taken. Members of the committee did express concern that no uh, funding had been referenced for the lamb and beef se sector. We listened to the Minister's rationale, which was based on the fact that prices appear to have stabilised in this sector. He did, however, note that the entire farming sector is extremely volatile and unstable at this moment, and that he ha has the option of going back to executive if further funding was required for any specific sectors. The committee members raised the issue uh, that this funding could be used to compensate those farm businesses that have already, been su already successfully applied to other COVID-19 funding schemes, such as the self employed Income Support Scheme. This is definite concern for some members who have indicated that they'd like to see some of this funding uh, used for businesses that are falling through the cracks of the other schemes, uh, as they are either not eligible 
for uh, other support mechanisms, or they receive so little from them that it's not worth talking about. And members highlighted give the example of the beef and sheep sector, which has an average un- annual income of below £12,000 over the past number of years, and as a sector would not benefit uh, greatly at all from the SEISS. Mr Poots was aware of this issue and indicated that he wanted to ensure that he did not inadvertently overcompensate those who had already availed of COVID-19 business support mechanisms. He did say that funding should be directed to those who needed it the most. The Minister is hopeful that funding will be released in a matter of weeks and certainly by the summer. He asked the committee to communicate to him what is considered uh, should be the priorities. The committee are considering this. We have written and we have written to a number of key stakeholders, and we will get back to the Minister in due course. The Committee also asked what steps the Minister could take to ensure that this funding did not distort market prices. We are aware that a cash injection of around £25 million into the, def- into the sectors could have the potential to drive down prices paid by the processors to the farmer. We are pleased to note that the Minister had considered this matter. Indeed, he re- referred to previous schemes such as payments linked to a uh, number of cattle sl- slaughtered that had, that, ex- that had this impact. Members also picked up the issues around how farmers would apply for this funding, how it would be distributed, the timescale for being, being paid out, and how DERA might address the issue of fraudulent claims. From our ongoing scrutiny of the food uh, producers, we are aware that the agriculture sector was also suffering, and so we are pleased to hear that the £368,000 has been secured, with 80% coming from the European Maritime Fisheries Fund. In conclusion, uh, a further issue uh, by the committee uh, was that of equality screening. We all recognise that this funding should get out quickly to farmers. However, it is also important that we do not forget to undertake equality screening to, to ensure equitable uh, distribution. Uh, I call Pat Cackney. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Um, so, as my colleagues already stated, there that we broadly in support of what the motion what it is. But I just want to make a point to members just across the house here, um, who laud the benefits of the United Kingdom as a political point. We collectively, together, pay our taxes into that pot, and our people across Northern Ireland are entitled to those benefits. It is no handout, it is no give out. It is an entitlement to all of us collectively. I just wanted to let that point, uh, Deputy Speaker, just there, because sometimes it is hard to listen to those political points come across when we are trying to do a very serious debate here. Uh, I note the Minister's rationale for choosing choosing 80 per cent of the proportion of the 2021 financial position to authorise to this vote on account. How confident, given as this is the only meant to serve the departments up until the end of October, uh, that we are creating a massive financial stress for departments for the last five months of this financial year. Everyone in this chamber is aware of the financial stresses that will arise from the COVID-19. I am very pleased that the Minister announced the extension of the rates holiday. I am also keenly aware that this announcement means we have spent more than we have been given in terms of COVID-19 funding. As we know, there are still holes in our support during this crisis. For example, and particularly for our sole traders and self-employed, as well as the long process that is required to allow the rebound of our hospitality and retail sectors. How confident is the Minister that, as more funding is required to deal with the crisis, departmental funding approval in this vote on account will actually be enough to secure the budgets until the end of October? Early warnings of spending pressures are going to be vital to us being able to adapt to fast-moving problems. As the first in-year monitoring round is coming up in June, is there any early warning signs, Minister, that departmentals that is concerned about? Since we have got up and running, we have been chasing our tails with the budget process. We are now about to put a second bill through on accelerated passage with the hope of a further bill to be brought forward in the autumn. 
How confident is the Minister that we can get ahead of this process to allow the important high level of scrutiny that needs to take place in this budget process? Finally, I would like to mention the crisis that no one seems to want to mention anymore, Brexit. I read a very, I read a very distressing document from the EU Commission which stated that the UK, all right, they've moved slightly, government has yet to even produce a timescale for delivering the structures necessary to implement the Northern Ireland Protocol. I know there is funding ring fence to deal with the EU exit, but given that we are fast running out of time, can the Minister assure us that this is not another black hole in our budget that we will need to scramble to deal with in the autumn winter time. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. I call Andrew Muir. Thank you, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker. Uh, when I spoke in support of the last vote on account on the 24th of February, I said the following with regards to the forthcoming financial year. The challenges in the next financial year are going to be significant and should not be underplayed by anyone. Mr Deputy Speaker, while I think we all knew that the challenges would indeed be significant, nobody was predicting that the departments would require a further vote and account just three months on. And nobody was predicting in Northern Ireland we would have over 50,000 people unemployed by the end of April and facing the worst economic downturn in history. In the whole of our sitting on that day, there was not one single reference to coronavirus that would utterly take and transform so many lives. My party will support this motion today because it is these unprecedented circumstances that have led to the departments urgently needing additional funding. It is, of course, the right thing to do in order to ensure that our vital public services can continue to operate. However, it is also extremely concerning that some departments will have effectively spent around 45 per cent of their budget when we are barely a fifth of the way through the financial year. Well, we could not have reasonably assumed back in February that there would be a further vote and account just three months later. This time around, nobody can be unaware of the sheer scale of the financial challenges facing our departments. A number of ministers, including the, uh, the Minister for Infrastructure this morning, have explicitly outlined additional resource pressures to get through this year. At this point, I would declare that I was previously an employee of TransLink and a member of ARDS and North Down Borough Council. I would agree with the Chair of the Infrastructure Committee earlier this morning about the need to ensure that the capital funding that has been allocated to those departments will flow. But across departments, revenue-raising activities have fallen off a cliff. While costs often remain fixed in order to maintain vital services and furloughing only possible in a relatively small number of cases, the additional money allocated by the Finance Minister for COVID-19 from Barnet Consequentials has gone some way to alleviating some of the most urgent frontline pressures. It will not be enough to cover the gaping structural hole that is opened amongst some departments. On that basis, there are two questions that need to be answered by this, uh, to this Assembly before voting for this motion. The first and foremost from the Minister for Finance is when he expects to get a complete view of the potential financial requirements from all departments and the assumptions used to get those figures. Some have submitted detailed bids, but others have not. And as the Chair of the Finance Committee outlined, we are still waiting to see a detailed recovery plan. Secondly, and perhaps even more importantly, we need to know where that money is going to come from to meet these bids. The UK Chancellor has previously spoken about devolved administrations having access to the UK reserve for additional funding. Access to funding from that reserve is a useful tool, but comes with a repayment requirement, and hence nothing I think that should be easily considered without exhausting all other avenues. Without more spending, uh, with more spending most definitely required across the UK to deliver both uh, recovery for both our economy and public services especially our health and social care system. Future Barnet, Barnet consequentials are likely, but are not guaranteed, nor is the sign, uh, size of those future Barnet consequentials known. Collective representations from the Northern Ireland Executive to Her Majesty's Treasury should therefore be a matter of priority in order to ascertain the scale and the timing of any future economic stimulus and support for public services. 
I worry we are continuing under the promise of jam tomorrow. Furthermore, I understand that the Assembly has the ability to borrow perhaps up to £200 million a year from the National Loans Fund for non-capital related purposes. We need clarification as to whether that is the case and whether it will be utilised and what strategic benefit will be realised from any borrowing undertaking. In closing, Mr Deputy Speaker, I think it is the job of this Assembly not only to grant the Executive the legal authority to spend so that the departments can carry out their core functions, particularly in these unprecedented circumstances, but also to safeguard the overall finances of Northern Ireland. By voting for this motion today, we are doing the former, but it is only by getting answers to the, our questions will we achieve the latter. And two other points just to cover. Mr Frew talked about the uh, rates relief announcement, which was made last week, and I too welcome that. But we also need to recognise that rates relief on its own will not help businesses get through the forthcoming recession. Much more is required in terms of a more detailed and comprehensive recovery package. And just touching upon the comments which were debated this morning and then last week in relation to support from hauliers, we understand that the Department for Transport has decided not to proceed with that package, and just to see if we get clarification from the Minister for the monies that are already allotted, whether those monies in Northern Ireland can be used um, without proceeding with the Department for Transport to support local hauliers, because a number of them are on their knees and are very, very worried about their future. And if we have that money allocated here in Northern Ireland, we should be able to use it to help them. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. I call Mervyn Storey. Uh, thank you, Mr Deputy Principal Speaker. And I rise in this debate again to revisit the issues which are uh, pertinent to us all, because, uh, like the member reminded us, we are taxpayers. Uh, as members of the United Kingdom. But we also need to remember, because I think there are many in this House who would like to forget that what we bring in is not sufficient to run all the services that we have in Northern Ireland. If you read the document that we have, 85 per cent of the total spend is as a result of the block grant. So we need to Sometimes it's like going back to primary school. We need to be reminded of the law of first principles. But I declare an interest as a member of the Northern Ireland Policing Board because I want to revisit the issue of the way in which the finances uh, have been distributed via the finance minister to the finance to the justice minister. Because we find ourselves, Mr. Deputy uh, Principal Speaker, in a situation where yet again we're playing ping pong. And I thought we had a collective five party mandatory coalition. I thought that we were all joined together to work to whatever agreements we come to, then we will see them fulfilled. But the Minister will recall that I uh, raised with him on the last occasion the issue in regards to the funding of the additional police officers that is in the new decade, new approach, or new approach, new decade, whatever it is you want to call it. And the minister on that occasion said, well, there are processes, and he had had a discussion with the justice minister. Thankfully, I had written to the justice minister before I had asked the question in the House, and I got a reply. And that reply is very enlightening for a number of reasons. One, it seems as though the Minister for Justice isn't really giving a priority to the new decade, new approach, because in the letter she said she has made clear to the Justice Minister in a meeting, or the Finance Minister in a meeting, that her priority would be the inescapable pressures in the first instance, as these relate to just standing still, and that only once these pressures were met could I consider allocating funding to the new decade, new approach related costs. The letter also informs us that the Finance Minister is in receipt of what that amount of money is to fulfil the promise made in New Decade, New Approach, and that is £40 million per annum. Because it's not a case of just going out and getting additional police officers and then you, don't, you pay them for the first year and then we don't pay them every other year. There's recurring costs that have to be met, and somebody has to pay for 
the bill. Of course, we noticed that money was allocated to the new medical facility in Londonderry. Only 15 million. When anyone looks at the current estimates for the running, the capital and the resource of that, it will be in excess of 30 million. Some people are hanging their hat on City Deal providing the additional money. But no doubt it will have recurring costs that have to come back to the executive. Yes, sir. I'm extremely grateful to the member for giving away. I just he was talking about the, 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 the ongoing costs of the, um, uh, the McGee Medical School. Would he agree with me that it would have been great to have two million pounds a year, which is being spent on subsidising non-existent flights to North America? And I believe it was agreed by a previous finance minister, a member of his party. I presume he'd agree with me. It would be much better that we hadn't put that in legislation and we weren't handing over that money every year. The member for uh, the question, I'm delighted that he's asked it because his party, I can remember, wanted to sell an asset uh, in relation to planes, and that was the city of London Derry's airport, and they didn't even own it. So obviously, I think that and when the it forests. and the forest, so it comes to an issue of, of dealing with public finance. I think the, mem the member and his party have to take into consideration that uh, it's not all the faults are not always on somebody else's. Uh, watch and on somebody else's side. But I come back to this point. And I want the, the minister to give a clear indication today, not as the member for the Alliance Party mentioned, jam tomorrow, but that money will be allocated to fulfil the promise made and the commitments entered into in regards to the additional police officers. You see, I think that there are those who would like the police service of Northern Ireland to be run into the ground and to be so constrained that it is incapable. It's incapable of dealing with public order. It's incapable of dealing with the many challenges that it faces. Let's remember, Mr. Deputy Principal Speaker, that some of those pressures and the shortfall is somewhere in the region of 53 million. Issues such as holiday pay, injury awards, estates, body armour, human resources, technology, district policing, custody, health care, and the list goes on. Cyber crime. All things that members in this House will come in through those doors and say, oh, these are, these are very necessary. But then their finance minister is not prepared to put the money to ensure that those are delivered. In conclusion, Mr. Deputy Principal Speaker, is another area of responsibility that the Minister has. And I want to raise it. I have raised it with him uh, previously, and, and I want him to take it away today seriously and to look at the operations of CPD. I am not convinced that the Central Procurement Directorate is giving the public sector in Northern Ireland value for money. I declare an interest as a Board of Governor of two schools in my constituency, Ballymoney High School and also William Pinkerton in Dervik. Those two schools are subject to rules and regulations that cost them money four times more than if they had the ability to be able to go out and to procure in another means. But yet, in the seemingly world of CPD, you're better spending £10 to be able to justify how you spent £1. And I think that it's time, long past time, that CPD was brought under some financial scrutiny. And are we getting value for money? We're talking about budget here. Of course, when it's not your own money, some people seem to think that you can spend it whatever way you like and then give accountability to others to make it very onerous and very challenging. So I asked the Minister that will he commit to ensuring that we have a procurement process, now that we have thankfully set aside some of the procurement rules from Europe which were nonsensical, and I hope they'll never come back. Uh, I hope that the Minister will be able to tell us how he will deal with the issue of procurement and that it won't be as he dealt with it in regards to the, the procurement of PPE for China, which never actually transpired. Thank you, Mr. Deputy.
I call Cahill Boylan. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and I welcome the opportunity to, to speak and, and support this motion to the floor of the House. Um, Deputy Speaker, we are facing an unprecedented health crisis that has, has and will continue to affect all parts of our society. This crisis brings with it massive ramifications that we will be dealing with for the foreseeable future. Of course, before this pandemic, we were already facing considerable financial challenges. Our block grant is £360 million in real terms below pre-austerity levels, and many of the members across the floor are denying that there was an austerity period, there continues to be an austerity period, and we're short of finances, and have been short of finances, and money taken out of this for a long and many a day, and that's why we're in the position. And I just want to use the example of TransLink, because it's my role in infrastructure. We had a briefing from TransLink to the committee pre this COVID, and also had a private briefing with one of my policy advisors. And they were saying for the last four years they have had a dip into their reserves to try and keep that going. And the point I want to make is if they didn't have to dip into the reserves, we wouldn't have been looking at it. And I welcome the £30 million package that the Minister gave last week to Translink. We would not have been looking at, to give that £30 million package to Translink. And that's the welcome. And that's part and parcel of, of some of the denial of some of the members here. I, yeah. I can remember forgiving me. I don't live in denial. I live in a real world. You see, it seems as though when it goes back to this point, does the member not accept if it was your own money, would you spend more than what you have? Or would you realise that there are some things you cannot do? But it seems as though the members opposite have an endless list of things that they want to do until it's something that they agree to and are uncomfortable with, like the additional officers for the PSNI, then they're not so keen of finding money. So it's only when it suits, and maybe the member needs to realise that what we have to do is cut our cloth accordingly, because that's the reality, one of the realities that I think COVID-19 is teaching us all. And, and the member will know, because he's been here long enough, he's a member of a scrutiny committee. He also knows he was a minister and he had a priority as his own monies. So, I mean, there's an opportunity there. If you're on a committee, scrutinise the minister properly. But don't bring it here. You keep saying that it's dirty, austerity, sturdy, like it didn't happen. We've been cut down for long many a day. Because the last day you spoke on the last day you spoke on the budget was the exact same thing. But I give the member the opportunity to come in. Just in light of um, this constrained financial position, in light of the sturdy measures I mentioned, I commend the move actually by the Minister of Finance to allocate eight point six increase in resource funding and a capital allocation of £558 million to DFA. This reflects the flagship status of a number of DFA's capital projects and the priority afforded to infrastructure by the Executive. It is vital that we see progress on these fundamental schemes. And it is something, and Mr Muir's way out, he mentioned he will have a chance as a member of the Infrastructure Committee to scrutinise the Minister and to scrutinise the capital spend, as well as the Deputy Speaker, who is sitting there obviously in a different role today. But with regards to the COVID fund in itself, I welcome the announcement made by the Finance Minister for Public Transport, the £30 million. This is on top of the £20 million allocated previously a few weeks, and this will be welcomed by the TransLink. It demonstrates the Minister's recognition of the importance of public transport. Meanwhile, the sum was mentioned 59 or 60 million, I know Mr Allister mentioned earlier on, which has been held centrally in relation to transport issues. I would like to ask the Minister, has there been any concrete proposals brought forward to the Executive or any communications to ask or inquire as to how or this money would be spent in light of some of the conversations that took place? Because I mean, it seems to me that you've been getting letters by pigeon. You've been getting letters and messages in bottles. You've been getting electronic messages recently. Instead of ministers sitting around the ministerial table and having proper discussions and conversing with all the ministers, every MLA in the place can write to any minister in the place. That's the role of the MLAs. But it seems to me some, some ministers take it upon themselves, rather than engaging properly uh, within, around the executive floor, they prefer to write letters. Um, 
just want to move on in relation to the. the yes, certainly. Yeah. The member clearly is speaking in code. I don't have the code book. If the member is referring to a minister, could the members advise this House uh, and those watching exactly what he's talking about? Because I have no idea. I have I've asked on a number of occasions of three or four ministers about um, funding and support for the taxis industry, three or four different ministers in this floor of the House. And what I am saying to you is ministers have, have been communicating in the executive through uh, written true letters. If ministers want to properly engage within the executive, they should be in there having conversations around the executive. That's what I'm saying to you. And it's up to us as MLAs. We can write to any minister a request a meeting with any minister. That's the point I'm making. I just want to just um, talk a wee bit about the because I, I feel um, like Mr. Allister, believe it or not, in relation to I think the freight industry has been has been left out of all this, and I know that um, there, there was a number of conversations with the Treasury in supporting the freight industry, and that has seemed to fall through. You know, there was a, a certain number of money, 90 million, whatever, 95 million. There is still something like 60 or 59 million. I would just like maybe the minister, if um, if you can comment in relation to that. And uh, obviously, with that, I support the, the vote on the count, and I'll comment later on some of the uh, on the second stage. But Gormila Mog, thank you. I call Paula Bradshaw. Thank you, um, Deputy Speaker. I rise to, to say a few words focused on health. Um, it should be emphasised, however, that one thing the current crisis has shown us is that health is all-encompassing. The impact of this public health emergency is felt across every walk of life and across every public service. Never has it been more, more important to look across the silos and base our spending on outcomes. This health crisis has em enveloped us all, yet it is still... Yet, sorry. It is well established that the Health and Social Care Board and Department of Health Workforce was already working hard to prepare for this pandemic. Just as we address the supplementary estimates here in the Chamber, we may be thankful for their planning and their foresight. This crisis has been shattering enough for us all, but without the pre-existing contingency plans and their dedicated work, it could have been much worse. Our key workers and volunteers working across the whole community with the support of the whole community have shown a spirit and determination which has been rightly applauded. We may note, therefore, that an extra allocation exists to ensure that nurses who had to go on strike not just for fair, play, for fair pay but fightly for safe staffing levels to ensure the welfare of patients will not be penalised for having done so. I joined, like many in this chamber today, joined the, picket, the nurses on the picket lines, and not a single one of them wanted to be there, nor should they have needed to be there either. In the general scheme of things, the sum of money to achieve this is dwarfed by other mammoth allocations to deal with COVID-19, but it says a lot about what and who we value. I am aware, of course, that health is over half the resource allocation from the block grant. We may, at, the, at this moment, be thankful that it is. We may also be thankful that another £205 million um, was allocated to manage the emerging pressures, um, money for vital PPE and more so for workforce was allocated to the department, alongside nearly £7 million for hospices, the need for which is obvious. Allocations to other departments, in many instances no less health-related in the broadest sense, I await further information about the £15.5 million allocation to the charities through the Charities Fund and how it will be allocated, much of which inevitably will fall within the health and wellbeing sector. There are also other vital areas such as childcare and shielding packages which may not nominally fall within health but are vital to it. Away from health, I would commend the funding allocation for supply teachers who had fallen through the cracks in the original plans. My inbox, like many others here, was jam-packed with teach, uh, sub, sub, teachers who were in dire straits, so I very much welcome that allocation. This does take us on to an area of the pandemic which I do feel has been often overlooked in the commentary around it. The implications of lockdown itself, of the grief and suffering given the scale of loss and the loss of livelihood, about which my colleague Andrew Muir and others have already spoken. They are fast and have a particular impact on the collective mental well-being. 
from the direct psychiatric issues emerging from separation of family and friends, or even lack of physical contact, right through to the rising rates of domestic abuse and child abuse. We may not just need to allocate funds to the Mental Health Action Plan and champion going forward, but to main mainstream mental wellbeing into everything we do, including planning budgets. I am concerned, Mr Deputy Speaker, going forward we are going to have to consider seriously where we are to find extra money to take us through the rest of the financial year and beyond. Do we have borrowing options? Do we need to look at revenue raising? Are there emergency funds we can access? Should we get serious about costing, cutting the cost of segregation? And most importantly, should we be speeding up the health transformation process? These are challenging questions that we cannot shirk as we move through this pandemic. To conclude, Mr Deputy Speaker, our jobs here today is to safeguard the finances of Northern Ireland and, most of all, the people of Northern Ireland. We trust in voting through these allocations that we are very much helping to do the latter, and that is why we must give them the benefit of the doubt. We will need more detail before we are sure that we are doing the former. Thank you. I call Jim Allister. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Um, here we are again discussing a further vote on account. And I have to confess to the House, I do not fully understand why we have not simply moved to main estimates. I know there's fluidity in the situation, there's lots of unforeseen, but the Westminster Parliament at the beginning of this month put through its main estimates. Now, it's living in the same fluid environment. So, though I've asked the officials at committee as to why we too are not proceeding in the regular fashion with main estimates, I frankly am not convinced that there's a good answer to that. So, perhaps the minister, when he comes to wind, could explain why it is that we're drip feeding again through an extension to the um, uh, more interim estimates. And in doing that, it brings me to one of my main concerns. We allocated up to 45 per cent of last year's budget to last to the end of July. It hasn't lasted. So we're now allocating in some cases up to 85 per cent, but let's say 80 per cent of resources, to last to the end of October. Now, the end of October is only seven months of the 12-month financial year. So if we are giving authority to spend 80 per cent of the budget in the first seven months of the year, what on earth? is going to happen in the last five months. Where are we going in that regard? There is a limit to the size of begging bowl you can produce. So I really would like to understand why we think it rational and right to take what round figures equates to 80 per cent of our resources and effectively say to departments that's your budget up just to the end of October. It doesn't leave much thereafter. And that has to be a major concern, uh, as certainly as far uh, as I'm concerned. There are a couple of individual issues that I'd like to take the Minister to. One of them has been referred to already in this debate. When I asked him last week about the haulage industry, this is what he said. I know that part of the transportation money that we've been holding back was in, was in anticipation of a request in that area. That did not emerge, and we went ahead then with the allocation to Translink. Now, this morning, the infrastructure minister, when asked about that, said, or well, she talked much about the Department of Transport, etc., but she then suggested there was still 59 million 
at the centre of transportation money. Now, can I ask the Minister, is that correct? Is there a pot labelled transportation of $59 million? And if that is so, is there any reason why the local departments of economy and infrastructure couldn't come forward with a proposal for the haulage industry to support it to spend all or a substantial portion of that money? In other words, is that pot of money available? Leaving out the Department of Transport, leaving out the Treasury, is that pot of money available to help the haulage sector? Because at this moment in time, the haulage sector seemed to be the forgotten key component of our economy. So I'd like the Minister uh, to elaborate further on that, if he can, because that seems to me to be a very critical issue. So on the estimates, we really, and you know, here we are for the second time, effectively approving 80% of the spend with very little detail, just with global figures for each department. There's no spending lines in this. Now, the critical thing about any legislature is that it is the ultimate authority to spend money. And the norm would be that you can see where you're spending the money. All we can see is global figures for each department. I don't think that lends itself to the, either the transparency or the accountability that uh, we uh, should have. So if we're going to produce these and a further budget bill, could we not at least have given spending lines for each department so as we could see where the money is going? And can the Minister confirm to me that by reason of the absence of main estimates, that means that no department legally can spend its own resources, which it accumulates. Until you have approved the main estimates, is it not the case that own resources cannot be uh, uh, the accruing resources? The accruing resources cannot be spent. So I would like some clarification on that, uh, if I may. And the final point that has been troubling me about this is we are going through the economic, the financial year. By reason of coronavirus, there is huge demand, but there also must surely in some departments be relevant savings. There must be departments which are not able to spend all the money they anticipated spending because of COVID. Yet these estimates, the budget bill, will not reflect that at all. What the committee was told was, we will not know that until we get to June monitoring. Well, would it not be more logical to ascertain that now, to see where are the savings that can be redistributed, rather than going forward blindly to whether or not there are savings? And I don't know if there are, but I suspect there must be across departments, and utilise that money so that we don't allocate as much as 85 per cent for the first seven months. Maybe the Minister could explain that as well. Thanks. I call Jerry Carl. Mr Deputy Speaker, uh, who pays for this crisis will soon be a key to the vein line uh, in politics. The Tories and others are already pushing the burden of payment onto ordinary people. Uh, Mr Speaker, the current crisis, which broadly speaking has two ends, categorised first by an immediate uh, health crisis, but secondly by a deep, deep economic crisis, demands a whole new economic outlook. One that prioritises the interests of working people over rich corporations and the wealthy. The period ahead is filled with massive uh, uncertainty, but one thing is clear we cannot return to normal, neither in economic terms or political terms. Uh, this is a crucial starting point for considering the financial position of this Assembly, the current vote on accounts, and indeed the upcoming uh, budget. That sentiment that we cannot return to normal has been reiterated around the world. No return to our nurses standing in the freezing cold for months for the pay they deserve, an end to the systemic 
underfunding of the health service until it is perpetually at the brink and unprepared for whatever crisis is around the corner, an end to bottom-level welfare and precarious employment contracts which leave too many on the cusp of poverty. This was the position, Mr Deputy Speaker, of my party and socialists before this crisis, but the response in this chamber and political chambers around the world has always been that the money isn't there. Well, Mr Speaker, if this crisis has exposed one myth, it is that the magic money tree does exist. Suddenly, when big businesses need bailed out, there is a forest of magic money trees. When the likes of Richard Branson needs a bailout, that magic money tree is indeed a whole island. Uh, the money has been there all along, and uh, one way we can get it is through taxation. And it's worth remembering, Mr Deputy Speaker, the two biggest parties who made up the, the last storm at the Executive spent the last 10 years begging Westminster to give them tax bars to give big businesses a break. For almost a decade, it was a major cornerstone economic policy of Sinn Féin and the DUP to ensure that the wealthy pay less of a tax contribution uh, in society. It epitomised neoliberal economics. Uh, that helped bring the current ruin upon us. And we have to ask why, as we sit on the brink of another economic crisis, the cornerstone economic policy of this executive is not to raise taxes on the rich and wealthy and to fight for an urgent, radical redistribution of wealth across our society. Thus, ensuring those who cannot pay will not be forced deeper and deeper into poverty. The DUP and Sinn Féin were unashamed at begging for tax powers once before to give the wealthy a break. Why aren't those in charge here willing to stick their neck out to give working people uh, a break? Why isn't the executive even considering the use of powers it does have already to lift the caps on rates for the wealthy and high earners, drawing in more money and using that to pay uh, for parts uh, of this crisis, uh, at least. And let me also say, in reference to comments earlier about the need for us to be thankful uh, to the British government, uh, public funding is not the British government's money. It belongs to the taxpayer, and it is a result of the labour of workers who create the wealth in our society, and we need much more of it uh, for wealth, and for wealth to be fairly distributed, uh, redistributed generally. This emergency demands emergency action, but neither this vote on accounts or the budget uh, does that, nor does it try to. There is no ambition for a different kind of economic agenda, and in my role as one of very few opposition MLAs, I will do my best to scrutinise and continue to hold those who are bringing it forward uh, to account. Take the health service. The big parties in this executive have spent years implementing Tory cuts to our NHS. This had a very real impact during the crisis with too few ventilators, ICU beds, too little PPE and without the capacity to properly uh, test. Austerity was never an economic necessity, as even right-wing economists will now uh, admit. It was always a political choice. And too often, the big parties here in this chamber went along with this political choice. Uh, because of this, we entered this health crisis with an underfunded NHS and health care provision, which undoubtedly impacted negatively upon the force of this crisis. One may hope there was a lesson here, but when we look at the projected costs and indeed how they play out in the new budget being proposed later today, it is clear that nothing has been learned. In the budget, for example, much is made of a 6 per cent increase for the Department of Health, which certainly would be promising if it were not for inflation and the fact that we are all living longer, adding to the cost of the health service generally, which means that this is not really uh, a real increase uh, in real terms. If anything, it is a repeat of similar baseline austerity budgets. Indeed, as I pointed out, Mr Deputy Speaker, on the Health Committee, these projections are predicated on a £50 million pound at least cut to health trusts across this region, £50 million from our health service at a time when people uh, are out every Thursday uh, clapping for the NHS. It would be unbelievable if it weren't so true to form. And it runs even deeper than this. It means the Bengoa report, which behind the double speak, is predicated on efficiency savings. It means a continued underfunding in mental health provision at a time when mental health support should be at least uh, double to meet the demand that is out there. It means a transport system through TransLink uh, that continues to be threatened with going to the wall. It means millions for new roads that will damage our environment through the use of cars, such as 75 million for the A5. And nothing to seriously tackle uh, air pollution or invest properly in public transport. Behind the tables and figures of these accounts, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and the buzzwords contained in the Minister's doc, uh, budget document, this is the reality of the situation. The economic model that favours a for profit system is having a crippling effect on our society. And in my constituency, the use of food banks uh, has soared, and unemployment and welfare reform is killing people. Where is the ambition to do better after this crisis? Where is the leadership? Uh, 
Uh, Sinn Féin and the, and the DUP spent the guts of 10 years, as I said, begging Westminster to let them cut corporation tax for the wealthy, but not a peep with regards to raising taxes for those who can afford to pay more so that we can provide a better future for our communities. Finally, I would like to take this opportunity to reiterate my deep concerns about the lack of scrutiny uh, throughout this budgetary process, indeed in this vote on account. I will not labour the point, but I uh, only want to say that in this scenario with a five-party executive, I do not think it is healthy for all MLAs to uh, endorse the executive's uh, actions. I will be continuing to challenge the executive, and obviously we welcome uh, new uh, monies and increased uh, 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 spending, but the point is this budget does not go far enough to tackle the needs that exist across our society. Uh, as a member of the opposition, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, as a socialist and as someone who has witnessed the very real impact of cuts uh, and callous austerity budgets on people in my community and across this island, I will continue to oppose what looks set to be another austerity budget, both in its financial projections and in its budget uh, form. I will continue to use my role to hold the executive to account. Thank you. I call Rachel Ward. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. As we know, and many have said in this chamber, these are extraordinary times, and this is reflected in the vote on account proposals before us today. We were due to get the main budget estimates for the 2020-21 financial year. It was in my calendar, in, in fact, until last week. And I was looking forward to offering some scrutiny on budget proposals and departmental priorities, which we haven't actually had the chance to do here so far. But because of the spending pressures related to COVID and the inevitable reallocations between departments, the Minister and Department of Finance are telling us that it is not possible and won't be so for another couple of months. We are told that we will not get the main estimates until the autumn, halfway through the financial year, and if today's votes are successful, departments will have already had access to over 80% of the allocations based on last year's allocations as well as their COVID resources. What happens then? What happens after the autumn for the remainder of the financial year? Clearly, the June and September monitoring rounds will be extremely important to monitor what is going on in terms of departmental spending, and I hope that committees and members will be given the full details of what we need to scrutinise the spend. I noted that listening to the Finance Committee last week, that questions were asked about the announcements for made for rates holidays for certain sectors and where they were going to be funded from. So is there a reliance on the June monitoring round for this business support? I also wonder if the Minister can address the fact that this Assembly will not have an opportunity to properly debate and scrutinise their budget allocations for this financial year until we are already halfway through it. Is this a good way of spending public money? We have not been able to make a proper assessment of departmental pressures, some relating to the New Decade New Approach commitments, because the information supplied prior to the budget vote, a vote on 5 May included so many TBCs and not applicables. We still don't have any clarity on what that actually means, let alone with regard to Brexit, which is equally unclear and requires details of what's actually going on. So is this a case of spend now and ask questions later? Or is this the executive acknowledging here that the department's spending might be in a mess that they intended to clean up later on? It would be good to hear from the minister directly on this point. If we are in a mess, after an unprecedented health crisis, spurring an economic recession, how will we get our questions answered? I do understand the need to get resources urgently to cash-strapped departments who are under serious pressure arising from the COVID pandemic. We are in unprecedented times, and I understand that much of the budgetary allocations that might have been in place for the start of this year may not be a priority now or come the autumn, and that departments need cash now. And we will not be standing in the way of this. We welcome the support granted so far to our businesses, our communities and vulnerable individuals, but we know that gaps still remain. Many businesses and people in our communities are falling through the very nets that are designed to support them. We need to do more, and as the Minister will be aware, to support those not eligible for any current fund, either supplied by Westminster or by the Department for the Economy. Otherwise, many businesses will not be reopening after this. We must be also very aware of the continuation of the furlough scheme, and any changes must be carefully considered. For example, hospitality business, one that I have acute knowledge of, if they cannot reopen safely, adhering to current social distancing guidelines and a furlough scheme stop or are significantly altered, we will see mass redundancies and unemployment and closures. That is a fact. I am more than happy to explain to any members from great personal experience of how working in a kitchen, a restaurant and a bar cannot be done safely under current social distancing requirements. It is not possible. 
Our councils too are facing huge financial pressures and will continue to do so. Much more will need to be done. Many other sectors required huge resources and financing regardless of COVID, but have now been compounded by it. Those dealing with mental health, support for addiction problems, the community and voluntary sector and so on. And we're yet to see a comprehensive economic recovery plan. As the Chair of the Finance Committee has stated, it is somewhat overdue. I would welcome the Economy Minister attending this chamber to outline her plan. We will need to know what it is so funding can be actually allocated. But we also need to know if this document, what it looks like, will we get to see it, let alone scrutinise it. And to reiterate, economic recovery must be a green recovery. It must be a just transition for our people, our economy and for our society. And I'm glad to hear the need for a Green New Deal being raised in the Chamber again today. But it was stated that many political parties supported this. Just to reiterate, all of the executive parties supported this in 2011. But despite commitments, no strategy was adopted and resourcing, no resourcing allocated. These are the same executive parties that are in office today. Higher levels of government borrowing are also spurring public fears of a new age of austerity where public services suffer as a result of fiscal restraint that is justified by the COVID response. What assurances can the Minister provide to the House and in general the public that this will not be the case in Northern Ireland? Some in Westminster might have given assurances that austerity is off the table, but how much can that actually be avoided is uncertain without a plan. The Minister, after being asked on the radio this morning about the pending recession, stated that it would be severe for Northern Ireland. But how do, we, how do we know the executive's approach to these problems is the best one? We don't have any of the details here. And it would be helpful to hear from the Minister as what other options were considered and what his expectations are come the autumn. I look forward to the debate on the second budget bill, where there may be greater opportunity to discuss the allocations, the allocations of other budgets and what is missing. And I know the Minister appreciates members' feedback, but also when there is a plan, ideas and solutions, solutions for moving forward behind it. And this is, of course, building back better through a green, just recovery. I call Mike Nesbitt. Uh, thank you, Deputy Speaker. First of all, I apologise for the late entry uh, into the chamber. Um, it wasn't my intention to speak, but I was listening and watching uh, upstairs in my room, and I was very struck by remarks from my good friend, Mr. Catney. Uh, when he talked about the fact that it doesn't matter whether you're a loyalist or a unionist or a republican nationalist or none of the above, if you're earning, you're paying tax, and therefore you're entitled uh, to access to our public services uh, and benefits are an entitlement. Uh, and I get that very much. Uh, indeed, I agree with him, but I hope he would also agree with me uh, that traditionally a weakness in our economy is that we contribute less to the Treasury than the Treasury gives us by way of the annual subvention that we call the block grant. In, in the same way, we were net beneficiaries uh, of European Union monies, uh, and we have come out of the European Union with no guarantee that those monies will be matched by the UK Treasury, uh, never mind that we will be uh, better off. Yes? I'm grateful to the member for giving away just on a point of information. I think he would recognise that, uh, just as a, uh, this is a debate that goes back and forth, but just as a point of clarity, the block grant does not represent the subvention if, for Northern Ireland, i.e. the gap between revenue raised in Northern Ireland and expenditure here. The block grant is not, that's not what that is. It's a, that's a different calculation, as it were. That's the amount of rev resource spending that the, that the executive has to spend every year. The members an extra minute. I, I, I take the member's point, but he will agree with me that the broad principle is we contribute less than we get back. And I'm, I'm going to come uh, to that again uh, in a moment. But, but what I want to say is, in terms of what the Minister does with the budget, uh, in, in my ten years in this House, and particularly my five years leading the Ulster Unionist Party uh, into repeated negotiations with the UK Government, it seemed to me that we were focused entirely on a dependency culture, where we were saying, we need more. Uh, and whereas what I would like to see is a switching to a prosperity agenda, where we say, give us the tools for us to generate more. Uh, and I'm old enough to remember uh, Harold Wilson as Prime Minister, I think it was 1974, calling us spongers. Uh, and on my wall upstairs where I was watching the debate, uh, I have a copy of a speech which the late Harold McCusker made in protest to the Anglo-Irish Agreement. Uh, in 1985. 
And he talks about sponges. He says, I have heard variations on the sponger theme. And he goes on to say, 35 years ago, we received 1.5 billion from the treasury. Well, today it's 12 billion. And the question has to be, has our tax take gone up eightfold in the last 35 years? And if it hasn't, what are we doing to try and generate more wealth, more prosperity, and therefore more tax? So I just wanted to make briefly this point. Yes, we have to protect our vulnerable. Yes, we need to look after those who are dependent. And yes, the welfare state is an entitlement. And I prefer the term entitlement than, than, than a benefit. But as well as that, surely we must have a focus on reforming our public services in education and in health. And think about the many people who woke up today with poor mental health, with no sense of purpose in their lives, unable to go to work, and taking entitlements, not because they want to, but because they don't have the capacity to do anything else. So yes, we need money to transform our public services, but I also urge the Minister to have a focus on using money to create a prosperity agenda so that we can become less dependent on the Treasury and more self-sufficient. I will give, give way to the member. Thank you for giving way there as well. And just to listen to the whole tone of the debate, we are all in this together. That means us, I, that we're more fortunate and we're able to, to plough or, or make a good living out of the economy here right through all of the troubles. But we need to realign our economy as well. And yes, out of, when we come out of this pandemic, there will be opportunities in order to try and reboot this whole economy. I have to agree with the, member, uh, the other member that stated, uh, if you let me, about the hospitality sector. Uh, that hospitality sector is not a standalone hospitality sector. It is the hospitality sector which is key to the economy of the whole of the north of Ireland, because if it goes down, tourism's down, hotels are down, and the thousands of jobs which goes with that. So the point uh, with yourself, uh, uh, Mr Nesbitt, is we are all in, of, in this all together, and we need to shoulder the responsibility. Some of us are very lucky. We're lucky can that I remind we can members take more interventions Thanks very much. Thank you. I, and I agree with the member, and I remember him famously saying in this House, uh, as a publican, all he was concerned with at the end of the day is what's in the till. And I think we should be concerned, metaphorically, with at the end of the day, what's in the till for our citizens in terms of their prosperity, in terms of their physical health, in terms of their mental health, and whether we have created a society which is fair and equitable and in which they feel they have a fair shot. And to do that, I firmly believe we need a prosperity agenda, and I recommend it to the Minister. And I now call on the Minister for Finance, Conor Murphy, to conclude and wind up the debate on the motion. And the Minister will have up to 28 minutes. Last concorda, uh, I, I know that the uh, supply resolution debates can offer cover many aspects, not always relating to the bill being considered. So, but on this occasion, I suppose for all of us, the background of the COVID-19 emergency has helped focus most, if not all, minds on the importance of public expenditure decisions we take in this place. Uh, there have been a range of points made, of course, in relation to uh, this debate, uh, and I remind people, I think this is the third what in broad terms could be considered a budget debate uh, in, the, in the last, uh, that I've been speaking at in the last uh, number of months here. Uh, and I, at the outset, I've recognised and continue to recognise that what we are not doing here is ideal. Uh, we started with the ability to produce a proper budget, given the fact that we were only back into the place in mid-January, uh, the difficulties that presented. the. Uh, area that we wish to get to in broader budgetary terms being a multi-annual budget, uh, given the spent review that's to, that is due to take place, and that remains to be seen, I suppose, uh, in Westminster uh, in relation uh, over the course of this year and the possibility of a second budget there in the autumn, uh, the, the ability to get that broader, longer term uh, budgetary position, which would give people much more scrutiny, much more advanced side of spending down the line and an ability to assist in shaping 
that in, in terms of uh, coalescence uh, with our programme for government and the priorities that are set by the Executive and by this Assembly. Uh, and then allied, and on top of all that, we have this COVID uh, issue, which has created uh, a huge uncertainty, in the, both in terms of how the staff are able to work, but also in terms of the, uh, of the that additional spend mm -hmm. that came our way and which had to be uh, put together very quickly and, and in terms of, of getting a response out onto the ground very quickly uh, had to be undertaken uh, at, a, I suppose, a pace uh, and a frequency with which perhaps this, this sector here, the, the civil service here, uh, or certainly the assembly here, was not used to, uh, and doing that on the basis of only having a small number uh, of civil servants who are actually readily available to us and others remotely uh, then has, pr has uh, proved a very significant challenge. But nonetheless, uh, and so I accept at the outset uh, that what we're do doing here in terms of the main function uh, of most of the members of this chamber, which is a scrutiny function as well as uh, involving themselves in legislation and, and all of the other work uh, MLAs go with, is not ideal. Uh, I accept that readily. Uh, uh, and it's my strong desire to get back to a, a more normal budgetary cycle in which we can have advanced sight, advanced debate uh, and full and proper scrutiny of all of the lines of spending that departments are, are producing and a chance to vote on those and democratically decide uh, how the budget goes. So uh, I, I want to thank the committee chairs for their contribution. I know in the main they have outlined the particular pressures and issues facing uh, their own committees. Uh, uh, and I know that the chair of the Finance Committee, uh, and I'd like to thank him and his recognition for the need to extend this vote on account. Uh, and we also must look to funding opportunities to support economic recovery. I accept that. Uh, I can advise the Chair of the Parts looking at all available options for resource and capital funding. As the Chair has mentioned, capital options include use of RRI borrowing and investment fund. Uh, but I think the borrowing issue was mentioned by others, perhaps including Andrew Moore. And of course, we, the executive has borrowed in the past, is paying off borrowing, and uh, it doesn't come without a cost attached to it. And so therefore, in the uncertain financial circumstances we find, it has to be something which has to be given very careful consideration uh, indeed. Sure. Just really briefly, and thank you for giving away, he, he's right that it, that it comes at a cost, but would he acknowledge that um, borrowing costs for the UK government, indeed for all governments basically at the minute, are at historic lows? I think for the first time UK bond yields pass into neg negative territory, which implies that we should give it a, a good hard look. It's cheaper now than ever to borrow to invest. Uh, yeah, and I accept that, uh, that, and that's why I outlined that we do and, and will look at all options uh, in relation to that, and that is the case, but we, we are paying off loans which, which were uh, secured at a higher rate, uh, and so we have to uh, look at the ongoing cost to the executive's uh, finances as a consequence of that. Uh, there were a number of questions, I, I suppose it was in the, in the line in, in, in some of my opening remarks about the the, de the risk of departments running out of cash. That does not mean that departments have spent their full year's budget. So just so that I'm clear, departments are continuing to operate within the budgets which the executive has agreed to them. What it means is some departments are now getting close to spending 45 per cent of the vote on account that the Assembly approved in the Budget Act back in March. And that voting count was intended to last departments until the end of July. But because of the extra expenditure with, with the executive has agreed in response to COVID-19, it means that for some departments this 45% voting account will not be sufficient to last until the end of July, and hence the need uh, for their uh, further vote on account. Uh, now, uh, the, uh, there have been a number of questions asked in relation to transportation money uh, for uh, COVID-19. Uh, and the uh, department uh, did uh, agree to allocate uh, uh, recently. Uh, this, is, this has crossed a number of members. I'll try and perhaps answer all of the questions in the same response. They, they were somewhere in the region £95 million allocated as a consequence of transportation uh, money spent in Britain. Uh, most members will know that comes across as a Barnet consequential, although we're not restricted to using Barnet consequentials in the same area as which they were allocated to us. They aren't hypothecated in that way. And so it's a matter for the executive to decide if they spend it in that regard. Nonetheless, the, the executive did agree in terms of that COVID money to set aside that money to consider transportation needs. And under the, that package, we considered the needs of the airports, we considered the needs of the ports, uh, and we were considering the need of the freight uh, industry, the haulage industry, which, which others have mentioned. Uh, and uh, there was a delay in allocating that money until we heard of the conclusion of the discussion between the Department of Transport, the Treasury, 
Department of Infrastructure here and I think the Department of Economy. Uh, and as I correctly uh, advised the Assembly last week, I was informed that there was no case uh, for that and therefore the fund wouldn't be allocated under that particular area. And I went ahead then with the allocation uh, to uh, TransLink. And I uh, remind members that that £30, £30 million pound allocation comes on the back of a £20 million pound allocation as part of the budget in March. So within two months, TransLink have been allocated £50 million pounds, uh, to, to cover, and I appreciate very much the difficulties which they and all of our public services uh, are under. Uh, the, the question that Mr Allister then asked subsequent to that, is there a possibility that the Department for Infrastructure and the Department of Economy locally uh, could, could bring together a plan to support the haulage industry? There's no reason why they can't come forward to the executive with a proposition. Uh, I can only deal, as, as my colleague across the way will know, the Department of Finance can only deal, and I'll get on to his matter in relation to PSNI and the Justice Department, I can only deal with propositions that are brought to me. Uh, I can't reach into a department and decide you need money and here's, here's how it shall be spent. So if departments do wish to engage with any sectoral interest that they individually or perhaps collectively, in the case of a number of departments might have, bring forward a cost of proposition to the executive uh, and make a bid for, uh, for allocation from the executive. And bear in mind, in relation to the last allocation, we have gone uh, substantially to the end of the COVID money was available. But that doesn't stop uh, a department coming forward or departments coming forward collectively with a bid. The executive then will decide whether that bid uh, is worthy of support or not. So, uh, and it's, it's the same uh, rationale applies to other issues, in this day, which I, I will come back to. Uh, so, we are very much aware uh, in relation to the uh, to that uh, the TransLink issue, uh, and as I say, in relation to broader issues in terms of ongoing support for various sectoral interests, be the economy or infrastructure or a crossover between the two. Then, of course, it is up to those ministers uh, to either work together or allocate the responsibility for one or other department and take forward a proposition. And that proposition, I can assure you, will get fair hearing in the Department for Finance. But then that will become a matter for the executive to decide whether it has the allocation to give that and whether it supports such an allocation. I'll give way to them. Hey, just so you're absolutely clear, is the minister saying there still is a £59 million pot for transportation? Uh, it's not earmarked for anything else at this moment. So if economy and infrastructure get their act together, there's no reason why the haulage industry couldn't be helped. There, there still is, a, a, as a consequence of the, the 95 million that was being held centrally, there remains of that almost 60 million. I have to say that, that and I, I made the first statement, that it, that's unhypothecated, so the executive don't have to use that for transport. They can choose to use it for something else that may be a bigger pressure that they consider at the time. Uh, and certainly in relation to our recent allocations to broadly support business in terms of rates relief interventions, that has uh, had a very significant cost to the executive. Uh, and of course, we are, have money set aside, which is coming through the business support uh, grants, which we then will have to assess what may, if anything, be left of that at the end. Uh, and so the, the executive have to take these considerations in their own. So rather than, uh, and that's a reason, rather than a, a kind of piecemeal allocation way of giving out support to various departments, we've tried to do it in stages where we assess a range of allocations together so we can have some kind of oversight and some more uh, strategic approach to all of that. So that uh, is correct in that there is 59 million of that 95 has not gone to transportation issues, uh, and it is uh, possible for ministers to bring forward bids for that, uh, but it's also possible for the executive to decide to allocate that in another, another area. Uh, uh, there were some questions in relation to a uh, shortfall of the, for the, of the capital budget generally. I think it was, again, the, the chair of the infrastructure raised this. Uh, the, the, in the most recent budget, aside from the COVID allocations, the uh, infrastructure department received over half a billion pounds to prioritise their capital programme. That's almost 40% of the entire capital allocation available to all departments. And with that allocation, the executives prioritised funding for flagship schemes such as the F5, the S6, and the Belfast, Belfast Transport Hub. So there is no shortfall of funding uh, in these schemes. Uh, just to go down through some of the other. Uh, uh, points that were made. Uh, the, uh, the, again, the, it, 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 I find this kind of amusing. It's a general theme in all of this that uh, I refer back to Mr. Story's comments about us all being in this together in the five party executive. But you find then when people are disappointed with their bids, it's either me and my own or me and the minister responsible who are 
who, who are responsible for these things not happening. Everybody here knows, and I, shouldn't have, I know there are new members here, but everybody knows the way the executive works. Bids are brought forward as part of a package. When executive ministers support those bids, it means they reject other bids as part of the package. So five parties agree these things. Uh, and you know, there was some reference to community transport made by the uh, chair of the Infrastructure Committee as if it was purely the responsibility of the Department of Infrastructure and the Department of Finance. It's not. If there's a bid under COVID money or anything else for funding for community transport or any other area, it's an executive bid, and the executive collectively will decide how it's done. And in that regard, I have to say I was disappointed and slightly surprised with Jane McLaughlin's remarks that the executive are now back to divvying up money between the two big parties. That's so patently untrue, even on a cursory examination, that the executive is divvying up COVID money in relation to the two big parties, as she says. The Department of Health got the second largest allocation of all of the COVID money we have received. The Department of Health belongs to the Ulster Unionist Party, not to the DUP or Sinn Féin. So, uh, and, and again, in relation to that, there is no divvying up between the two big parties. I go back to my point, these propositions are brought to the executive, and I think with one exception, one minister, and it wasn't her own minister, uh, objected to some of the uh, allocations. The executive have agreed every other allocation of funding uh, that has, has gone to date. And in agreeing the allocation of funding, as I say, they also agreed to reject the bids which are unmet. So, I mean, I'm not sure, you know, if, if this narrative is about playing, being in the executive and being in the opposition at the same time, uh, but that's transparently uh, untrue, or if it's some kind of uh, scene setting for some exit strategy at some stage, well then at least it should be done on the basis of honesty. Uh, and to, to throw out a cliche about the two big parties divvying up the money between them is, is so untrue uh, that, that, as I say, even a cursory examination of the allocations to date show that to be untrue. And also the idea that we, we don't have any joined up plans. The executive worked across all five parties for quite some time with disagreements in relation to our approach uh, to how we manage this crisis, quite evident, worked through and reached an eventual agreement in relation to a recovery plan to move us out of the lockdown, uh, which has, has and, and from my sense of it, and I'm sure I'm not mistaken, has got widespread uh, approval from the general public and most people who commented that it's a sensible plan. That is a joined up plan. We also have, and a number of people have mentioned, the economic recovery plan. The economic recovery plan was sent to the executive last, I think, Wednesday evening. It was, the executive meeting was to happen on Thursday morning. The plan was a very detailed and lengthy plan. And in order to give executive ministers, including executive ministers from the smaller parties, uh, a chance to properly study that recovery plan and to provide commentary on it, rather than receiving it a matter of less than maybe 12 hours before the executive meeting happened, then we decided to put it off to the next available executive meeting, which happens to be this Thursday. So the conspiracy theories around these things don't stack up in that regard. If the economic recovery plan had arrived on Wednesday evening, been taken and adopted by the executive on Thursday morning, I'm sure there would have been uh, correctly criticism of that approach to things. So the economic recovery plan will be discussed on Thursday's executive, and we will attempt to reach an agreement in relation to it. Uh, so, uh, you know, this categorization of divvying up and the two large parts. I mean, it's all the cliches of a number of years ago. So I, I, I'm not sure what the point of trying to revisit that at this stage uh, is. But I can assure you that the money has been given out in a fair way because the priorities the executive set themselves are being met. And that is to assist. The, the, the central priority of the COVID money was to assist the health crisis, to assist the economic crisis and to protect vulnerable people. And you look across the range of allocations in relation to that COVID money and you'll find that that is by and large how it was met. It didn't matter who owned the department, it didn't matter what the responsibility was, that's what the executive agreed and that's how the money has been allocated. Uh, Alan Chambers went on to criticise that the health department had not got enough money to begin with. Quite true. Quite true. We have a nine years of austerity brought in by the David Cameron government, and you may remember the position of your party in support of trying to secure a uh, David Cameron-led government, which was offered them your full support. So that's the consequences of it. And then, in a remarkable act of, uh, of, of, of self-denial, you asked us at the end of your contribution to take the blinkers off and recognise that we had got all this money from the British government. We've had nine years of austerity, and that's why we've had lockdown, because we have a health department that isn't able to cope 
with a significant health crisis because it has been underfunded for years. Uh, and then when you ask again about the money that didn't materialise or the, the, the projects that didn't materialise under the NDNA money, again, we negotiated that in good faith with the British Government. And the first act they did when we reached the new decade, new approach document and put the executive back in place was to withdraw the financial offer they had made. So that's the reason that we're facing the financial difficulties we're in. So on the one hand, you can't laud uh, the behaviour of such a government, and you're quite entitled to do, uh, and then berate us for the, the, the place that we find ourselves in uh, in relation to it. Sure. And, and, and I accept he, he makes the points he makes about the, the, the Cameron government, but would he not accept in terms of the health service's ability to handle this crisis that there is an issue regarding a former health minister who sits on those benches who didn't do all she could and was advised to do in terms of preparing for a pandemic? Well, it does get away from the central point that the health department has been underfunded uh, for a significant number of years, and austerity has had its impact on it. And so, on the one hand, you can't support parties in Westminster, be it the previous Conservative government or the, the, the last and current Conservative government, uh, and then demo, be, bemoan the, the, the outcome uh, of those policies. Uh, can I say then uh, some specific questions will come to uh, Paul Fru asked in relation to the utility regulator. Uh, the previous vote and account already provided by the Budget Act in 2020 provides the utility regulator with 90 per cent of their total funding, which is due to receive from government, and there has not been any further pressure identified by the utility regulator. Uh, the utility regulator only receives a very small proportion of its funding from government. The majority of funds which it needs to carry out its work is funded through the fees it charges to electricity, gas and water industries that it regulates. So if there are any pressures facing the utility regulator, there will be an opportunity to bid for it in June monitoring, and these can be considered by the executive, but we are not aware of any pressures that have been raised uh, to date uh, by the utility regulator. Uh, puzzled with that percentage, and I, I might well be wrong, but looking at the figures in front of us, how does the Minister get to a 90 per cent uh, percentage point uh, with the information we have at hand? It seems to be last year that they are setting at 25 per cent in last year's terms. How does that go to, from 25 per cent last year's terms to 90 per cent? And I know there is a difference between resource and cash. Can the member enlighten me on that? Uh, the Minister? Well, I know that the, the member raised this question at the committee, uh, and officials give him uh, an explanation. If he, if he wishes, I can ask officials to uh, write to him to, uh, to reiterate the explanation that was previously given uh, to him. Uh, there were a number of other issues raised by other speakers, but I have tried to address them in the general sense in, in relation to, uh, to uh, funding for infrastructure and other issues. Uh, Mervyn Story raised once again uh, the issue of the, the funding for the PSNI, and as he knows all too well, having been a finance minister, I can only respond to bids that are made to me. Uh, and if no bid is made in relation to that, uh, then I cannot respond to that. Uh, and there is no bid being made, uh, as, as, as far as I'm concerned, in relation to uh, an increased recruitment. I did have a conversation, as, as he alluded to, uh, with the Justice Minister that I did with all. Uh, executive colleagues individually in the, in the run-up to setting the budget. Uh, and so I, I have not been dealing with any bid in relation to that. And of course, he also knows, in terms of setting that budget, uh, that the executive approves the budget, and so does the Assembly approve the budget uh, again. So uh, that, that's where that, that lies. And to try and sort of dress that up, and I know he likes a bit of cut and thrust back and forth across the chamber with some of my colleagues here, but to try and dress that up in some way as a political opposition to the outcome of that spend is unfair, because I have no issue in terms of an increase. Uh, it was part of the NDNA commitment, which we signed up to. Uh, I have no difficulty in, in meeting, and Sinn Féin have no difficulty in standing over the commitments that we signed up to. So it, it isn't, I can assure him, a matter of any political disagreement or reticence uh, in terms of uh, supporting the fine, front and for it. And I thank the Minister for giving me, but, but it goes back into this territory but it's not my responsibility. I'm waiting on these bids to come in. And it's clear from what the, fine, what the uh, Minister for Justice has said, she's not prioritising the additional police officers. So she's working on the other pressures. And if we're waiting for that, while there is strategic outline cases, which are now some of them moving to uh, business cases, that is some progress. But my central point is a deal it's a deal. 
And if it said we're going to have medical school, and on the opposite page says we will have additional police officers, 7,500, to me, that's a deal not waiting for a business case. But it does lead to the question, could the minister maybe tell us what the process has been to remove the medical school out of the Department of the Economy and Health into the Executive Office? And why has that happened, given the fact that responsibilities for the delivery of that project primarily lay in those two departments? Well, I say, firstly, in relation to the, the uh, PSNI bid uh, and his, his view that it was part of a deal, I'm conscious of my, this is my clock here, Mr. Speaker, so I'll endeavour to be quick. Uh, the, uh, if that was part of it, the, the, the responsibility for sorting that isn't with the Finance Minister to go in and demand that the Justice Minister brings forward a proposition. There is a party leaders forum, uh, which I think was set up as a consequence of NDNA to discuss issues that might be outside of the day-to-day -day workings of the department. So I think if there is a, an argument that that commitment has not been met, met, met in relation to that, then I, I would suggest to him that that's the, that's the area to, to raise that. And hopefully then secure an agreement as to behind the done, and I'm more than happy to play my part in relation to that. Uh, the, there was a time pressure in relation to the McGee uh, and University of Ulster situation uh, where uh, agreements needed to be made uh, in terms of the match funding of the future, uh, Inclusive Future Fund uh, and also the intake for the general uh, entry medical school or the graduate entry medical school, sorry. Uh, and there was a, a, a lack of agreement between both departments as to who was the lead responsibility for that. And in those circumstances, I think correctly, the executive office and the office of the first and deputy first minister stepped in to try and arbitrate and find a way uh, through that. And that's how that ended up within that department. Uh, I'll try and... Uh, I'll try and, and conclude as quickly as I can, uh, last Concorda. There, there was an issue uh, raised in, in relation, in, in the general sense of, of, it goes back to this issue, I suppose, with the uh, freight industry and haulage uh, in relation to taxis. And again, can I say that I have had no proposition uh, at all put to me in, in regards to uh, a, a costed case of how to put forward. Uh, executive colleagues raise at every single meeting difficulties that various sectors have. And sometimes they write to each other about difficulties that various sectors have. But when somebody wants an issue to be addressed, you bring forward a costed proposition to do so. Uh, and that's how the sub-teachers issue was dealt with. That's how the agriculture industry was dealt with, because the agriculture ministry brought forward a proposition. Uh, that's how charities issue was dealt with by the community minister. Uh, and so whoever, and I, I'm not precious about who decides it's their policy area, but it's certainly not the policy area of the Department of Finance. But whether it's infrastructure or whether it's economy or if whether it's a combination of both, no one has yet brought forward a proposition for how to deal with taxi drivers. And I've seen plenty written about it and said about it, uh, but I have not had any proposition, nor has the executive the ability to consider anything. If, uh, as I say, letters come into the executive all the time and emails telling people we have problems with this and problems with that. That does not amount to a solution or a proposition how to deal with it. And if people want it dealt with, then they know executive colleagues know how to bring forward uh, such a proposition. Uh, just briefly, uh, Jim Allister raised a couple of points about the main estimates. I explained at the beginning of the debate it was not possible to produce the main estimates document to the executive's up-to-date expenditure plans because the executive has been constantly reacting to emerging COVID-19 situation. Most recently, I announced, uh, I announced the most recent allocations last Tuesday. If we had tried to write a document to the executive's expenditure plans, it would have been out of date before it could have been produced. And that's also why the vote of account cannot contain the level of detail that will be contained in the main estimates document. And clearly, I have committed to taking a main estimates document uh, early in the autumn. Uh, he also asked what happens when we reach October and we've accessed up to 80% of our voting account. Well, as I said, we'll, we will bring a main estimates and associated budget bill to the Assembly by early autumn. And this will allow access to all available cash and also access to all available cash and access to receipts accruing resources that are not available at the present time. So to remind the member we have a further spring supplementary estimate before the end of the, of the final year uh, to allow for further monitoring rounds that will take place uh, throughout the course of the year. Uh, there were uh, a number of other points were made. Uh, Mr. Carroll raised the issue of taxes and I remind him that we don't have the sort of taxation powers that he berates us for not using. Uh, and when he refers to this as a new budget, it clearly isn't a new budget. It's just an extension of, of an existing uh, vote to account. Uh, and, and I hear 
the, the litany of grievances that he raises, and, and, and I agree with quite many of the grievances he raises that people find themselves in, but simply rehearsing those in every speech that he makes here doesn't provide any solutions. Uh, and if he wants to hold us to account and if he wants to assist us in trying to provide solutions, as we are doing on a daily basis, to people who need it most, then perhaps it could be more constructive contribution than simply rehearsing them. Uh, otherwise, it's just simply rhetoric. Uh, the, Rachel Woods asked some questions in relation to uh, the furlough scheme and the hospitality sector. And clearly, we understand the issues that the hospitality sector are going through. The furlough scheme is, is extended to October, which is welcome, but we have no certainty from August through to October at what level the employer contribution will be, and that will have a real impact on particularly people who work in that sector, which, which is largely low paid and casual. Uh, and so we do, and that's why we included the hospitality sector in terms of the rates extension for the end of the year. And I, to, to conclude, uh, I completely agree with Mike Nesbitt in relation to prosperity agenda as opposed to a dependency culture. Uh, the, the argument around the, the subvention is the extent of it. Some people would have told us a few years ago it was 10 billion, and now, now in relation to a recent answer I was given by the department, it's closer to three. Uh, but nonetheless, that tells us the gap we have to close, and I would prefer that we could close that gap uh, through our own uh, efforts. So, uh, Mr. Speaker, I, I want to thank again the Finance Committee for their agreement uh, to take the legislation, which will follow by accelerated passage. And uh, I uh, would uh, draw my own remarks to close and commend the further vote on account for 2021 to the Assembly and ask members to support the motion. Before we proceed to the question, I would remind members that this motion requires cross-community support. The question is that the motion relating to the supply resolution for the Northern Ireland estimates further vote on account as detailed in the order paper be agreed. All those in favour say aye. 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 Contrary no. Aye. All those in favour say aye. Contrary no. Aye. I think the ayes have it. I think the ayes have it. As I am uh, hearing ayes from all sides of the House and no dissenting noes, I'm satisfied that the necessary cross-community support has been demonstrated. And if members wish to disagree, please repeat uh, your opposition. Is that a no? Okay. If that is still a no, uh, just for information, members, you should continue to disdain or dissent if, if you uh, wish to uh, have a vote, uh, and I will respect that uh, on this occasion, as I should do. So I'm saying clear the lo lobbies. The question will be put in three, member three minutes, and I would remind members that you should continue to uphold social distancing, and that members who have proxy voting arrangements in place should not come into the chamber. Order members, would members resume their seats? Before I put the question, I would again remind members present that if possible, it would be preferable if we did not have a division. The question is that the supply resolution for the Northern Ireland estimates further vote on account as detailed in the order paper be agreed. Previously, Mr. Carl had indicated his opposition but I am putting the question again. All those in favour say aye. Aye. Contrary, no. As I am hearing ayes from all sides of the House, I am satisfied that cross-community support has been demonstrated. <clears throat> the next item of business on the order paper is the first stage of the Budget Number 2 Bill. And I call the Minister of Finance.